Hello again, friends, and you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here, wherever it is that you are on this beautiful Monday morning slash afternoon. Hey, let's be honest, Monday evening, wherever you are, I am your host, the great Brian Last, and of course, the man who will be answering your questions, the leader of the cult of Cornette, the exalted one of the LaSalle, Mr. Jim Cornette. Wherever you are. Just, just, uh, just Whoever willy nilly throw it out there. Wherever you may be, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the drive through with the great Brian Lath and Dim Cornette. Uh, you just throw it out there wherever they may be, for heaven's sake. People are, are, are in their homes or their places of business or their, their transportation to and from. Hopefully, staying away from other human beings that can spread illness and disease and germs. Or possibly incubating right there in their own, their own particular castle, wherever they may be across the world. Brett, you know what I'm doing, don't you? I'm just blathering here. I know. Because we have gone in. You know, normally, we go into these programs with only a smidgen, an iota, a minuscule, granular amount of what knowledge of what the fuck we're going to do. Or what we're going to talk about, what we're going to say. The experience, more often than not, I have scribbled some topics down on a piece of paper. You here rely on the cult of Cornette, but oftentimes we have we have things to review or major happenings have gone on, things that demand our attention, but we so we just we just go with the flow. We have little to no preparation, but we have set a record today. Cause I don't even know what fucking day it is. I don't really know what's going on. No two topics that uh, in the world of professional wrestling that uh, and and its ancillary surroundings that I want to talk about today and otherwise I don't know whether to wind my ass or scratch my watch because I've been in the mail order mines 12 14 hours a day for the past several days making sure that people have a merry christmas and you you've been trying to uh, assimilate the Arcadian Vanguard Empire over there. All these shows, the editing, the 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 things that are whirring around, all the you know, Jason Nabokov and his cousin Vladimir, Jason Nakarado, him him too. All of the people who were over oh, Kippelman, everybody that works in the uh, in the Arcadian Vanguard periphery. There, you've got them running full times. So we we have have prepared us, and so we're going to make this an old fashioned kind of show. We're going to give it all over to the cult of Cornet. Their questions, their comments, their concerns. We're going to talk about that today. So if the show sucks, blame the cult of Cornet. That's right. Is that enough of a caveat? I think so. We've established who to blame. Now we're blameless <laughs> right. for whatatever this episode will be. Now, our hands are clean now. <laughs> our hands are good. Our hands are clean. Whenever I do that in front of Harley Quinn, that means no more, no more treats, no more food, and she walks off. Because that's, <laughs> you know, that's that's the signal. I'm not getting anything more out of this conversation. Well, there you go. Nor am I. <laughs> Nor are you. Should we go ahead and just mention, by the way, I did mention I've been working in the mail order mines, and I'd like to explain that not 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 everybody uh, took my advice to heart and got their order in before December 9th, if they expected before Christmas, because things have still been somewhat hectic. Uh, and so I just want to give you an update because this is what I've been doing to make sure that everybody's as happy as possible. I've, I've been giving people fair warning on these things. If you've sent me money, if you've spent money with me, and that's a wise thing to do, except not this late in the year. Uh, but if you ordered through Tuesday morning, December the 8th, everything is in the mail, except for a couple of t-shirts. We had a little mix up from the processing plant we may be a couple of shirts short but don't fear not i don't want to cause a panic uh if you ordered between december the 8th and the morning of december the 11th that's going to be shipping monday and wednesday december 14th and 16th and it may still be there by christmas if you have ordered between december 11th and december 14th there's no way that stuff is going to ship until uh, Friday and Saturday, December 18th and 19th, just being perfectly honest with you, uh, unless they add hours to the day by congressional order. 
And if you order after December 14th, it most likely won't go out till after Christmas because I need a couple of days off just to make sure Santa Claus doesn't come down my chimney and order something from me. He's going to eat all my cookies, drink all my milk, and 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 leave six orders on the uh, fireplace there. So fair warning. Uh, if you order after December 14th, by the time that I can turn it around and get it shipped out, it, it's not going to ship till after Christmas. And I love all of you. And thank you for the support this year. Um, but we are running out of almost everything. A lot of t-shirts are off sale. It's not a glitch on the site. If you, the shirt you, and size you pick is not available, we have sold out and can't possibly restock by Christmas. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Classic sets are down. Same reason. It's time-consuming. Uh, but we, uh, plenty of, uh, well, I don't, I'm not even going to pitch anything else. I'm not going to make any more excuses. We got nothing. Everything's sold. There's nothing more to see here. Uh, and, uh, we are going to be closing the online store on December 31st. We'll be closed through the month of January for a rest and to restock it, et cetera. And we'll be back hopefully with some upgrades and things to talk about in the month of February. So that's just, that's a, just a warning right now forever. Now everybody's clear because the more that I don't want to sound like I'm yelling at the people that are sending me money, but here's the thing, Brian, I've noticed this. I, I get a lot of female business this time of year. Uh, that maybe that didn't even sound proper. Did it? A lot of, a lot of the, uh, female gender, order from me for their significant others this this time of year and they're used to ordering from all the big retailers like sears and roebuck and jc penny you know all the hot stores no they're, they're used to ordering off of amazon and they get the confirmation number and the guy in a fucking bow tie brings it to the door and puts a little dog treat on the top of the box for the pet the next day it's a 24-hour service whatever and so they they order something and five days later, they don't have it. They're fucking freaking out. And there's a many of those emails at this time of year. But the more time that I've spent answering those emails, the less time that I have actually preparing and shipping of the merchandise. So I'm getting, I'm getting the bulk of everything out. Then I'm going back and making sure everybody's tidied up at the end. But we, we, we do have, obviously, we've covered this. We do have some female listen, listenership. I have testimony to that later here in the program. But a lot of times, it's I've noticed that this time of year, it's the... And you know, that just goes to show that we got a bunch of fine gentlemen in our, in our listening audience. If all of these women are going to all this trouble to order... And and buy things for these men of of, the, of some of their favorite people that they enjoy and listen to and are fans of and etc. Well, that just shows what great guys they are. We got a fine, upstanding audience with with no moral turpitude problems whatsoever. Sure, we do, and we have <laughs> lots of questions from that audience here today. You might have I've heard. You might as well just come out, yeah, out of this here crook is innocent. That was a full-throated endorsement of the fine, upstanding people that listen to this program that engender this loyalty and passion and love from their significant others, and you just slap that right down with a, here they are. They're great people. There's a lot of love amongst the cult of Cornet. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, you're true. You're you just showed your true colors shining through there, Brian. Last you down deep, you think that everybody is as as snidely as you are. That's not true. I don't think anyone can be as snidely as I am. <laughs> All right, Whiplash. <laughs> What's on the program for today? Well, we have a lot of questions. A lot of questions that have been sent in. Some good. Many, many bad. <laughs> and we also have some questions about some hot button issues in wrestling. And I have to say, at the end of the show, we have some songs. The Christmas themed cornet songs have started to come in now. Oh, excellent. Okay. This is going to be worth waiting for. I don't remember if we had any of those last year, if we actually had Christmas themed songs sent in. Do you remember? I don't think so. And to be honest, it, it, I hate to say it, but we would remember it if any of them were good, wouldn't we? So. Well, there we would go. also remember if it was truly bad. Some of those ones stand out as well. 
That's true. I don't remember a Christmas themed uh, song last year, so we will have to, uh, but this will be excellent. Well, before we get there, we have a lot of questions and a lot of, like I said, I hot had a Christmas issues. themed uh, song on the program last week, or maybe it was on the experience. Jingle bells, jingle bells, and shave your balls. What did I say? <laughs> well, they're not sponsoring this episode. Uh, well, this I week. wasn't going to mention the company Manscaped, but I was just going to. I had a, I had a Christmas themed. I think it was just jingle, shave your balls. There was jingle, no jingle balls, bells. shave your balls, shave your balls, shave your all. I don't know. I can't remember it now. We'll have to go get Kippelman on that. All right, what's going on? Literally, after you sang that, I went to see him. Like they did not put this in the copy, did they? Because <laughs> every now and then they put some wacky stuff in the copy. They're weird. They're weird, <laughs> wacky, wild, just wild. Well, we have received a ton of questions, and I'm sure this is no surprise to you about. Something that just recently happened, and in the last couple of days, we've received a ton of emails and even some tweets asking about recent comments that Jim Ross made about, I guess the best way to put it is the style of wrestling some wrestlers in AEW yeah. utilize. Yes, yes. And this and this was actually, this was on Twitter over the past couple of days, and I have been getting up in the morning and checking the Twitter machine and saw this, and even, and I responded, or didn't respond, but commented on it, but go go ahead and read the, the question from the listener. Uh, well, we got several questions, so I'll just sum them up and say that the questions are about what Jim Ross said, what your thoughts are about that, and some questions were specific to the responses, because there was a response from a anonymous AEW wrestler, as well as one from Brandon Cutler, which we'll get to in a moment, but let me, for the listeners out there who are unaware of what Jim Ross said, this was the quote... I guess it was in a recent interview. Jim Ross was talking about how finishers are not protected anymore, and he said, That evolution of the business is bullshit. Yes, they should be protected. The DDT is a finish. The superkick is just a part of the flow of the match now. Nobody wins with it. What does that say to you? Does that say guys back in the day were more proficient delivering a DDT? or a super kick than in this generation where things are evolving, and that's in quotes there. I want some proof of that shit. I want somebody to prove to me that the changing of the wrestling business is what it is today, and it's making a difference. I say no. I told a kid the other day at AEW that everybody does the same fucking spot. All you guys go outside, you cluster up like coils, you stand wait, there... No, wait, a wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, I gotta stop you. I got to stop you there because I listened to the to the JR making this statement the the audio of this and apparently there's not a lot of ornithologists out in the audience <laughs> because he didn't say they cluster up like coils he said they cluster up like quail like a bunch of little birds like quail they cluster cuz quail cluster up in a big bunch a covey of quail and then go ahead, but it's not coils. And and but the wrestlers and and apparently some of the news sites that have transcribed this are not up on their their uh, Audubon Society handiwork. There, go ahead. You cluster up like quails. You stand there in a huddle, friends and foes together, side by side, so you can catch some leaping idiot going over the top <laughs> who never wins with this move. <laughs> they are looking for the holy shit chant. They love to hear this is awesome. It's a spot, folks. It's a trapeze act. I don't buy into that. The DDT is a great finish and should be used as such. So before we even talk about any of the responses to Jim Ross, what are your thoughts? I mean, it doesn't sound radically different than what you say I here on the show, does it? And no, there wasn't as many F words um, content-wise. And it's not like that... My God, that we are saying that suddenly Jim Ross and Jim Cornette, that either one of us are saying that we have suddenly hit an epiphany, that this is brilliant knowledge that we are sharing, that we are still, we are stating the obvious. We are stating the bald faced fact, whether I am more unsavory in my delivery and, and JR is more uh, low key and, 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 or, just basically, uh, uh, what's the word I'm searching for? More uh, less insulting about it, but is at the same gobsmacked. Why that this is like saying water is wet, 
and it's dark at night. For anybody that knows anything about the profession, industry, sport, endeavor, line of entertainment, whatever you want to call wrestling, it's not hard to figure out if you accept when, when you are one of the people who have gotten into wrestling with the thought of changing it, evolving it. JR and I were of a generation, of a, multiple generations, that we got into the wrestling industry because it intrigued us, interested us, fascinated us. We were fans of it. How, whatever the description may be, the way that a, a lot of people, not all, but a lot of people get into business is by being intrigued by some part, wanting to be part of that. Who gets into something that they want to allegedly, allegedly want to be a part of and then proceed to shit on half of the things that it take, takes to make that thing up? Well, now that I got in here, oh, wait a minute, shit. This is harder than it looks because I can't really do this shit convincingly, but I've, you know, spent a long time playing on my trampoline when I was a kid so I can do a lot of cool flips and I don't look like a badass. I can't intimidate anybody, but I can dive and shit and, you know, and I don't actually have a personality or I'm not able to speak on television extemporaneously and in such a way that my personal magnetism makes people want to see me and buy into my shit, but I can fucking hop around and talk about how the little niche audience that I do draw with my performances gets me seven stars. That's the thing is you don't get into something because you want to be a part of it and then turn around and say, well, shit, I don't have many of the tools that it takes to be successful in this. So I'll just ass off and do some shit that I can do that gets me over, but doesn't really make any sense in the context of what we're trying to do. But back to the original topic. No, I'm not surprised JR said that because he's trying to smarten these guys up. And it, apparently it's, it's not that easy to do because not only will I'm sure no one take that advice, but as you mentioned, uh, one of the, the, one of the boys on the roster of all friends wrestling, what was his name? Br Brandon Cutlet, Brandon Cutler. I thought it was Cutlet. Wait, hold on. Wait a minute. Let me get to it is absolutely Brandon Cutler. It's well, hold on here. What do you get? American, American heritage dictionary. Cutlet, <laughs> Cutlet, nondescript piece of white meat. Bland. <laughs> yeah. It's Brandon Cutlet. Maybe it is Brandon Cutlet now that you yeah. say that. Yeah. So this fucking wiseacre, this uh this fella apparently takes issue because he's actually he's the guy that went to school with the young bucks, right? Not even high school, like middle school. He is legitimately a guy that's only there. We joke about all friends wrestling and everyone always hires their friends. In a lot of cases, they hire friends who are doing things in wrestling. This guy is legitimately only there because he's friends with the Young Bucks. And That's he it. And he admitted in an interview, I, I don't want to be wrong here. Was it high school or middle school? I believe it was middle school. Oh, I don't know. I always picture the Young Bucks as homeschooled guys, so it's hard for well, me to imagine them <laughs> in a school hallway. Actually, they're, they're, the, they're the only students in the history of Rancho Cucamonga that the fucking school asked their parents to homeschool them. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so yeah, school friend, Brandon Cutler, Cutlet, whatever, Picotta, Marsala, whatever. You say tomato, I say whatever. Anyway, this fucking clown was signed to this company as, to, to wrestle, and, and we've seen him a couple of times, right? There wasn't even one of the battle royals or whatever. They can't put him on television. He's never actually been on the real television program. But he was in one of the battle royals, something they did, and and he also... I think they they have him running around back with a camera. It's like you know, it is almost like he's, the, you know, the slow son of of some money mark, and so they give him some task to perform. But anyway, he's a young buck stooge. I mean, to use a yeah. classic wrestling term for why he's there and why he has a job and why he's piping in here, 
He is the young buck stooge. Yeah, well, see, they can't say that. They can't say what he's what we're about to say that old Brandon Cutlett said. They can't say that because then that would get heat because they're knocking right. the greatest announcer in wrestling and and they're the executive vice presidents and he's also probably the highest paid guy on their roster. Jr. I'm talking about. Uh, so they can so they get their stooge to say it. But this little weasel who apparently now is getting a chance to be on television, real TV, Pinocchio, has to be the one to fire back at Jr. for giving these guys some certainly constructive and valid criticism, and basically just saying what everybody with a lick of sense thinks when they do this shit over and over and over. And he said, what did what what was it he said there, Brian? I have it right here. I'm on his Twitter page. It appears that the last time we saw him, he was just, like you said, a generic white guy. It appears now he has stolen the look from the video game series God of War. He's dressed <laughs> I could be wrong, he looks like Kratos <laughs> from God of War. But here's his I'm tweet. starting to worry about you that you know who these people are. Hey man, there are good games out there. You're not gonna shit on all video games. Or all video oh, games. Oh, oh god damn boy. There's a difference a between a great Brian Last and a Kenny Omega when it comes to people who play video okay, games. Okay, quick draw McGraw. That was goddamn that fastest gun in the West on that. Hey, there's good video games. There fans. are. You play your Tetris. Well, okay, but I'm not dressing up like a goddamn like fucking a Tetris. Uh, like a <laughs> Tetris, like a block or what. I'm not putting myself in a box and making it my picture on Twitter like this clown. But anyway, another fucking video game character in a wrestling well, business. Again, I don't know oh, for wow, sure. How revolutionary. I don't know for sure. I'm just saying. Business, acting like a video game <laughs> character. That's cutting edge. I'm just saying he looks like the character Kratos from God of War now, although much, much skinnier. But here's his well, tweet. I'm, I'm just saying he looks probably looks like 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag is what he probably looks like these days. This Wednesday on hashtag AEW Dynamite, seven versus seven. We're going to go outside, cluster up like coils, stand <laughs> there in a huddle, friends and foes together, side by side to catch some leaping idiot going over the top. Can't wait. 8 p.m. TNT. Hopefully, for one million viewers, let's effing go. And of course, there's also an image here of this match. Jesus Christ. <laughs> for Dynamite this week, it is the inner circle comprised of Chris Jericho, MJF, Sammy Guevara, Ortiz, Santana, Jake Hager, and Wardlow against a team of best friends, varsity blondes, <laughs> top flight, and the aforementioned Brandon Cutler. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? I mean, they would need five Rand McNally road atlases and a GPS to be able to figure out that match. This, is this a live episode, by the way? We're going to get we're going to give them their million. I got news for you, by the way, Brandon Cutlet. At one point uh, in, in this program, a million people might be watching this show, but not while you're on it, Skippy. But we might we might pitch him a million because this is promotion. Is this going to be live? If this is live, I cannot wait to see the clusterfuck of all clusterfucks of epic proportions <laughs> at a 14-man tag team match involving these dipshits. Is this going to be live or do they have a chance to fix this before we see it? Uh, it doesn't indicate it here. I thought this was a live week coming up, but I'm not. Sir. If this is a live week, this could be the greatest match in the history of AEW. Because, <laughs> I mean, this is going to look like a monkey fucking a football. This will be the biggest four-finger stinker in the history of goddamn all of wrestling. Uh, so I can't wait. But yeah, that's the kind of stuff that this little Jack, can you imagine the withering glance? Actually, I was going to say, can you imagine the withering glance that Jim Ross is going to give his clown when he shows up to work Wednesday night? But I'm not sure that Jim Ross knows what this guy looks like. Well, you know, I was about to say, it doesn't say anything here about elimination match. It appears to just be a straight seven versus seven. Yes, that's even even better. They all got to be in there the whole way. And well, you know it's going to last 20 minutes because they can't help it. What I was going to say is best friends or favorites of Tony Khan. We saw Varsity Blondes this past week show some potential. Top Flight also showed potential, just recently came in. I'm going to guess maybe Brandon Cutler is doing the job. He's the <laughs> only guy that no one cares about on an entire team. Well, he's also going to find out that he just, the first time he gets a chance to show his little fucking white ass on television, he's just pissed off the announcer that might have 
Actually, well, I was going to say might have actually gotten him over, but once again, JR is the greatest announcer in wrestling, but he's not Merlin Magician. You couldn't get this guy over with fucking a 10,000 pound tank of helium. But this is the kind of little smart asses that they let. Can you imagine if he, if I, even going into Mid South Wrestling, a little rookie manager, had said something smart ass about Jim Ross at that point when he was Bill Watts's hired announcer? Watts would have, he, he might have done the angle with me and punched me instead of slapped me and give me brain damage. Of, or he might have just kicked me out of the fucking locker room. But th- these little fucking jack offs and their little treehouse schoolboy clique that they've got going, the, when, they, when people that obviously, obviously know more about the business that they're in than they do, whether they want to admit it or not, whether they can grasp it in their little pea brains, and these people tell them, hey, you dumb shit, this is what most people think when they see you do this or say this or or react that way or whatever, and that's why that we're fucking turning cartwheels and blowing kisses in the air when we get a million viewers, the same thing that one of the three programs that TBS used to air every week 30 years ago the same viewership it got when it was delayed till midnight on Friday night by the Atlanta Braves. But they don't want to listen to that shit because it part of the taking on board that knowledge has to be them realizing shit. I really don't fucking belong in this goddamn business to begin with. And they don't want to hear that. But fuck, when I was a kid, the, you know, Brian, I've never been a real sports fan. I loved wrestling and roller derby when I was a kid. But the one real sport that I have been interested in and that I will get excited about and watch on purpose and and even have bet on in the past, especially with Ric Flair, and just get emotionally invested in is basketball. Not because I like to just watch anybody play basketball. When I was a kid, of course, when I was six and I could go see the Harlem Globetrotters in person, well, that was great. But then we also had an ABA team here. Uh, And I got to see an ABA game when I was like six before they folded up. Outlaw basketball. Imagine that. I love the red and white and blue uh, basketball they used. Used to play with one in my driveway. I just I, I was predisposed to like basketball, but I only watched the Harlem Globetrotters once every couple of years when we go live. And boy, it was nice once a year they'd do the thing on Wide World of Sports, and you'd see some of the same spots. And you pretty much knew what was going on anyway with the Globetrotters, even when you were six or seven. But the ABA, the Kentucky Colonels, and then later on, a University of Louisville Cardinals, college basketball, that's what I started watching not only because it was real, but because I had somebody to root for. I had some emotional investment in it. Hey, our guys, the Louisville Cardinals, especially with the, the 1980 season, with Daryl Griffith and the Doctors of Dunk, they get national publicity. They're in the tournament. It's on NBC. They got the cool theme music. This is it. Kenny Loggins, blah, blah, blah. These guys are on the front page of the newspaper here in town. There uh, To this day, Daryl Griffith's picture is on seven stories of a building on the way to downtown on the Waterson Expressway. So that's, you've got somebody to root for. I didn't want to watch Michigan play Indiana because I don't give a fuck. You have somebody to root for and it means something. And then every game means something. And then the tournament means something. Winning the title means something. It's the same principle as wrestling. That's why all the local heroes in wrestling were so prized and highly paid and valued because you need a local hero in every territory. And once you've got one, then you can feed him some heels and the people are invested in what's going on. It's not going to see the Harlem Globetrotters do those funny spots once or twice a year. It's watching the University of Louisville Cardinals get a winning season, get a winning record, go into the fucking tournament, go into the fucking NCAA. Are they going to win the big one? That's our guy. Is he going to win the world title? Jerry Lawler here in Memphis, Dusty Rhodes in the Omni. It's the same fucking principle. And nobody, I know that there's people who will just watch every basketball game or every football game or every whatever 
But to get big crowds, I think everybody will agree there's always got to be the team you're following, your hometown favorite, or your team, or your fucking... Uh, it, 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 even if it's even if it's not... Uh, why do you like the New York Mets? You live in New Jersey. It's the same for your region. You see where I'm going with this. Your guy, America's team. That's the important thing. That's what wrestling used to be. People wanted to get into it to be that and to be part of that. Not to go around and tickle a bunch of people that came and bring their kids to laugh at you once a year. And nobody is going for the investment of being the hero that the people want to see take that long road to the tournament or to the championship or to the victory. They just want to be a bunch of goofs tickling their friends and doing the bucket of confetti spot or fucking hiding the basketball underneath Curly Neal's fucking jersey. Your thoughts? Well, I will say I'm looking into things right now, and it appears that a, you mentioned you saw Brandon Cutler with a camera. In fact, he is the guy who films most of the Young Bucks comedy show. That's what I'm saying! BTE. I didn't realize that. He's the guy behind the camera for their right-wing brand of comedy. We do have another quote here. No, they they don't even have a right wing. Bra hey, let me tell you something. Dick Cheney is a hilarious motherfucker like Chris Rock next to the Young Bucks. <laughs> they don't have a right wing comedy. They are right wing fanatics, them and their whole family, but they don't. They just have a bad comedy show because they don't want people to know that. I have a somebody. Somebody told me they're, they're like they have a sister that's like just a Trump nut on Facebook. Just a lunatic. Her whole family just nutty and with the red hats and the fucking patriotic 1776 shit one of them playing a fife and the other one with a drum you know we always say this all those people who think that aew is all inclusive i wonder how many of them realize that everyone in management and the top stars are all maga guys they're all major <laughs> trump guys in some cases the cons major trump financial supporters they give what a million dollars to the inauguration trumpers birthers and flat earthers is what we got going on over there and they're and 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 we're the fucking horrible people over here. Well, I have a quote here. This is from an article. Uh, the website is wrestlingnews.co. The author is Paul Davis. It's regarding this whole Jim Ross controversy. Wait a minute. Wasn't he the guy that sang I Go Crazy? I don't think it's the same Paul Davis. I go crazy when I look at your wrestling. I go crazy. <laughs> One wrestler, okay. one wrestler gave them the following statement on Ross's comments, did not attach his name, so there's no attribution here. Look, I know there is a lot that Jim Ross can teach us, but burying us on the show or on his podcast is only going to make some of us ignore what he says. I grew up watching JR, and he is the best, and we love it that he calls our matches but maybe find a different way to criticize the wrestlers in the ring. Everyone is doing what they have been taught. I agree. What's the that, fuck? I agree that sometimes things need to be slowed down, but that won't happen when the guy who was supposed to help put us over is going out there and publicly burying us. Well, but you're missing the point is that JR didn't just come out with this on the show saying, yeah, boy, I've, feel like many times I've felt like telling these guys and then say it. He said, I told these guys, you think that's the first time Jar's been there for a year. Do you think that's the first time he has shared that pearl of wisdom? The most obvious thing of all of the obvious things that's wrong with the show, the matches, the, the, the work, the style, the, the whole nine yards of all the obvious things that we call attention to every week. That's that's the white whale right there. That's the big one. You think that's the first time he said it? Has anybody quit? There's more of them. Haven't we? Do we joke every week? And then they did the dive because there is literally they've got guys that are six feet, six and 300 pounds. They're doing dives. There's a dive or multiple dives in every match and on every show. And there has been for a year. So you, what about? JR has been saying this to these guys and finally he's sick of them fucking ignoring him because it's fucking continues to be as stupid as it was the first time you saw it. Well, to me, it's not even just about the dive and you're right about that, but it's about specific to what he said. And we just called it out a couple of times this past week. As soon as you start seeing guys on the floor, 
getting close together. You know a dive is about to happen where everyone's standing next to each other, arms around each other, like it's a chorus line, like the Rockettes. And someone dives on top of everyone, wipes Hello, everyone Hello, my out. baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my ragtime gal. Now I pay attention when that happens because I'm always amazed how many times the guy jumps over onto the group of people, the quail, as Jim Ross would call it, and he actually lands directly on top of the guy on his own team. Yeah. Who's got, to be quite honest, his partner probably has the most vested interest in him not paralyzing himself, so he's going to get under there real good, but it's just ridiculous. And it, it, this is a good example of why I knew right from the start, I want to be anywhere around this fucking dumpster fire or have anything involved in it, because anybody that's going to tell these guys stuff that limits them to logic and the, or the rules of wrestling or the parameters of the endeavor that they're in and requires them to have talent for it to do it the right way rather than just going out there and doing the shit they want to do, they're not going to listen to. And so when you... And I, can, I feel for JR. We've mentioned in, in the past, you can hear sometimes when he verbally eye rolls because he's having to call something that's the... Fucking modern day equivalent of May Young giving birth to a hand. What do you fucking say, right? With some of this shit in the ring, it's fucking stupid. And or he tries to lay out sometimes when things are going on that's just a mess. But he's got to be frustrated, and obviously nobody's going to listen because if you take if you take away anything that is stupid looking, phony looking, choreographed just sloppy work, just the inexperience, just the stuff that, you know, as everybody says, well, JR has much to teach us. Well, if you took all the things he has or anybody else competent has to teach people and applied them, you would have to get rid of half their roster because half their roster, such as Mr. Cutlet was signed specifically to do this shit that their little nucleus enjoys the little nucleus besides Cody that has the ear of the money mark that is financing this thing because twinkle toes, McFinger bang and fucking pockets, whatever. It's just, it's, it's a social club on national television rather than a serious effort to change professional wrestling for the better. I'll bet you that once some of these veteran guys like Jim Ross or Tully Blanchard, maybe even Jake, any of these guys who've been brought in, once they start leaving, the truth's going to start coming out that, yeah, we sat down, we tried to talk to these guys. They don't want to hear. They'll say, MJF, listen to us. I guarantee they'll say that. But they'll say, all these other guys, we talked to them and they don't want to hear it. And that's the thing. There's never really been a time in wrestling before where the guys who are hired, who are in many cases younger guys, simply do not want to hear anything that do anyone you know from why a different that generation. Why do, why do I think that is or why do... What I, I can tell you exactly why it is because until the day that the territories died out, if any young talent had had the attitude or the, uh, the it refused to listen or acknowledge what was going on or whatever, they would have either won or all of these either had to slap shit slapped out of them, shit kicked out of them, fired, or uh, all three. And and if they had then gone to, if it had been one of the boys or some of the boys in the locker room that did it, and they'd have gone to the fucking booker or the promoter and said, hey, so-and-so slapped shit out of me or so-and-so kicked my ass or whatever the fuck, that that's the would have been the people that would have fired them for it. Yeah, because you deserved it, you fucking stupid fuck. What do you think? You're going to fuck the business up around here? Get the fuck out of here. You got in the business and the veterans told you how the business worked and you learned from that. And the way that you changed the business was by drawing more money than they had without sacrificing the concept of the business. And then you became a bigger star doing what the business was, not changing it, excelling at it. Fucking idiots. Anyway, well, you know, if Brandon Cutler is this upset that he's willing to go on Twitter on behalf of, we assume, on behalf of his bosses, his friends, and I guess fire back at Jim Ross, if he's this upset, maybe he should get off social media, 
And maybe he should speak to a therapist. Well, you know, you are exactly right. And I know the people that he can talk to. I don't know if actually if even better help will talk to Brandon Cutlett. They do have some standards. But folks, in all honesty and in all seriousness, if you need somebody to talk to, especially during the days of the pandemic, if you not only now don't have access to in-person service like this in your area, but also you don't want to avail yourself of it because that means going out amongst the people, amongst the COVID, now you can get professional, licensed therapy, online professional counseling done securely with the folks at BetterHelp. And it's available worldwide, no matter where you live, what country or what state. You can log into your account anytime, send messages to your counselors. You get to pick the counselors and change them if you want to find the right fit. They'll work with you. And you can go to BetterHelp.com and read the testimonials that are posted daily. We've read a bunch of them from the Cult of Cornette listeners here about how they've helped them with their services. You can read testimonials from all over the world at BetterHelp.com and at BetterHelp.com slash drive. You can get 10% off your first month's services. A million people, over 1 million people even, that's a bigger number than a million, are taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional with BetterHelp, and you can too. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash drive, 10% off the first month. I got to think we ought to get JR a lifetime membership because now that I'm thinking about this, I know I know what he's feeling because Tony, it doesn't bother Tony. Tony was away from the wrestling business for 18 years. He He's just he's just amazed at all these guys diving and he laughs and he chuckles because he's like, well, I don't know what's going on here. Nobody else does either. But wow. But but for a guy who has been in every major company and at a high level for so long, Jr. sitting there, why it's like it would be like me in a room full of Russo's at the TNA production meeting, or it would, it would be like Albert Einstein with the third grade math class. It would just, so I think maybe we get Jr. a lifetime subscription to better help because that way he could have somebody to talk to daily when he has to deal with these people is like, my God, he's playing chess and they're, and they're trying to figure out how to eat the checkers. Better help. <laughs> well, Jim, let's get to another question. And this is another very popular uh, topic that many another, people. Another another popular to popular topic. A very popular topic. A that very many popular people, topic. Many people have sent in questions about it on Twitter. Do you do you pop out at parties? Are you unpopular? Many people have sent in questions in various fashion to corny drive through at gmail.com, but we'll use one from Twitter here. This was sent in. On Twitter, using the hashtag corny drive through from Heel Champa. What are your thoughts on the news that WWE sent Keith Lee back to the Performance Center? I thought Lee's work and agility were amazing considering his size, but I would like to hear your take on this one. And we've received a ton of questions about this. I have an article pulled up too. Apparently, Keith okay, Lee. Okay, well, fill us all in. For those of us who do not live and die by this information, fill us in exactly what's going on here. Well, let me just ask you before I go forward do you know anything about this already? I do not know anything about Keith Lee. Okay. Uh, so, no. Well, here's an article. I'll pull it up from the Wrestling Observer. I site. thought he had just he had just gone to the main roster, right? Did they just send him back? He did. Well, here's the article. Uh, this one's from the Wrestling Observer site. Uh, not written by Dave. Uh, someone else wrote this. Josh Nason. As reported by Dave Meltzer in this week's Wrestling Observer newsletter, WWE chairman Vince McMahon recently, quote, threw a fit about the working ability of certain main roster talent ordering some of those in his crosshairs to do additional training at the Performance Center. Meltzer noted, in particular, some of the talent that drew McMahon's ire are of the larger variety. PW Insider's Mike Johnson put some names to that on Friday, reporting Keith Lee, Otis, Dabo Cato, Dio Madden, and Omos, I think that's how you pronounce that. Omos? <laughs> Is it almost? AJ Styles' bodyguard. Almost, almost? 
are among those who are taking classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays with Adam Pierce and Drew Gulak. Arturo Ruas was another wrestler that is believed to need additional work, but he is currently injured following his NXT Championship loss to Karrion Cross. Lee was called up after SummerSlam and immediately began a feud with Randy Orton. He has been a fixture on Raw, but recently made his main event debut in a win against Angel Garza. Okay, but so so he hasn't been sent back. He's not to, back at NXT, but he's to taking NXT classes. or developmental. But he's back. Okay, well, there's several things. Number one, that was not unusual with uh, with guys in the OVW days. That guys would be, I mean, not guys that have been on the roster for you know main roster for years would suddenly be splitting their time between both. But guys who had been brought up would still there'd be a transition period sometime, or maybe they'd say, well, hey, we'll have them hang out in Louisville the three days a week or whatever and still go to class. But uh, so that's not, this is not revolutionary. Secondly, obviously nobody's saying that Keith Lee and Daba Kato and Famous Amos and, and uh, all of those people are at the same level of experience or, or talent or uh, the amount of progress in their in ring career, whatever the fuck, they're not at the same level. But what I'm seeing here, especially since a lot of it is big guys, is Vince. I'm just trying to read the the mental telepathy that he sends out. That's how he used to tell us how to do a lot of things by mental telepathy, and we wouldn't pick up on it. And then he'd say, "God damn it, I wanted it th- done this way." <clears throat> he doesn't think any of these big guys can work like big guys and get over like big guys anymore. And so he's probably, it probably he might have seen something that one or two guys did, and s- just said, "You know what? <laughs> All these guys <laughs> make sure they're having a class with Adam Pierce. Tell them how to work like fucking giants. That is that's as possible as anything. And and uh, also it it the way that they have phrased that, not happy with their work. It's because it's so." it's such a one dimensional way to, to write this article. Cause they don't really understand the difference. Vince is not talking about, I'm sure that he feels that Keith Lee's power slam is just wonderful. And his splash off the top rope is great and doesn't hurt anybody or whatever. He's not talking about teach these guys. Well, maybe in Dabakato's case, we haven't seen much of him. I don't know how he is maybe, but and Otis, Otis is a guy we said, wow, look at some of the things he's done, which has probably come back to bite him in the ass because that guy shouldn't do a lot of the things he can do unless it may be the main event at WrestleMania. Um, but he's not having them teach them more moves or how to do the moves better or perform the moves, which is what a lot of people think when they hear teach him how to work. We've said before, Keith Lee is an amazing athlete, but he works with some guys that are 150 pounds lighter than he is. Like it's, it's equal, like it's even, like it's supposed to be even. I, I, you know, and, and I, we've said that on several occasions that he is, has the potential to be a huge star, but that he needs to be a more fearsome giant. Maybe Vince don't like that cheerful, you know, uh, Frazier crane delivery. I don't fucking know, but, that's what probably I would have to say if they're giving them to Adam Pierce and who else did you say? Um, Drew Gulak. I have not haven't met Drew, but if they're giving to, giving them to Adam Pierce, he's wanting them. Vince is wanting to teach them more thought about what they're doing and why and what they should do and shouldn't and how to get over as big guys and as impressive big guys. And in that vein, that's what they're they're doing. And I can't say that 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 shouldn't be done. But I'm I can pretty much guarantee you that that Vince just saw one guy maybe do and just said I've had enough because I've seen this all over the place and blah blah blah. And these guys need to learn how to fucking work. And if there's one thing we know, Vince loves his big guys. Yes, he th- these are guys that he will if if they give him anything. He'll make them a million fucking dollars because he's predisposed to like them already, but they can't go out there and have, didn't we see Keith Lee at one point working fairly competitively with Johnny same face on NXT? 
He did, but but you can't blame him for that if they're putting him in there with Johnny Same Face and they're telling him, you know, he's a main event guy. You have to work with him like he's the size well, of Damian Priest. And that's why Vince is sending him back down because that, that's I didn't say they were teaching him right. You know, that's what the the uh, unnamed AEW guy said. We're doing what we were taught. Who fucking taught you this shit? That's the fault of the inexperienced promoter and booker allowing him to uh, himself to be misled on talent if they come from schools where they were taught to do all that shit they didn't come from very good fucking schools i can say that as 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 someone who personally had a hand in training most of the big stars in the wwe the last 20 years i not only can never remember teaching someone how to do a dive outside the ring i can't remember ever calling one in a finish and all those guys made millions of dollars. So I don't know what schools all these people are going to. Well, you know, some people may think that the reason Vince is upset with these big guys is they're not starting their day off with a healthy breakfast. Well, you know, that's true, because instead what they're doing <laughs> is they're they're obviously they're 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 following all these little midgets around like Austin Aries, this little vegan self instead of getting a good hearty breakfast but you can still eat healthy you can still eat healthy in the morning without slaughtering any animals or eating a bunch of carbs and sugar and junk and all that stuff all you have to do is get on the magic spoon and we've talked about this the magic spoon cereal is the best tasting cereal in the history of the planet normally I'm not a big fan of cereal unless it's covered in sugar because it to me it's like cake the only reason for cake is to hold the icing up. Formerly, the only reason for cereal has been to hold the sugar up. And I'd add sugar to the cereal that had sugar on it, because otherwise it tasted like roofing tile to me. Well, this magic spoon freaked me out. Brian, I know your kids love it. Uh, Suzanne loves it. You love the, what was it, the I cocoa it. or the or the fruity? No, the frosted. The frosted, I'm sorry. Delicious. Because I love the frosted too, but the blueberry is just off the chain. But regardless, however they've done this, I think it may have a little bit of soil and green in it. I'm not sure, but we don't want to ask too many questions. But this is the best tasting cereal ever with zero sugar, 11 grams of protein, three net grams of carbs per serving. Now they have, you can build your own custom variety box, the cocoa, the fruity, the frosted and blueberry. Now they've come out. Have you heard about this? Peanut butter and cinnamon, which I haven't even had yet because I got to get my order in. Anyway, it's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, GMO-free, but it tastes good. And you, I know you put the milk on it. I don't even put milk on it. I walk around eating it like trail mix because it's a nice little, it feels like you're being bad and naughty. Little snack. Anyway. I guess we should tell people how to get this shit, shouldn't we? If you go to magicspoon.com, that's magic and spoon put together, magicspoon.com slash gym, you can build your own custom variety box so you can pick all those flavors that I just talked about. Be sure to use the promo code gym at checkout to get free shipping. Magicspoon.com slash gym, use the code gym for free shipping. And remember, they got the 100% happiness guarantee. If you don't like it for any reason, they refund your money. No questions asked. They will not interrogate you. They'll not persecute you. They'll give you your money back and say good day to you. Magicspoon.com. Well, Jim, we've received a few questions about wrestlers on Cameo. Of course, we played some audio of The Undertaker <laughs> speaking to his fans a few weeks ago. All elite Scooby-Doo. <laughs> well, apparently, just about everyone's doing this now, with the exception of you. I got your note. Well, I've, and we've talked about this. I'm sorry, I don't have time to, to eat all of the meals a day that the government suggests that a human being eat to be healthy. I don't have time to do can. I don't have the smartphone. Don't have time to do it. I'm, I, I, I would want to do a good job. I would take it seriously. I'd need to do preparation. I'd need to check some of these people out if I was going to talk about them. 
It just it's just not working right now. Go ahead. Looking at some of the wrestlers that are now on here and how much they're charging, this may be something we have to consider. <laughs> but now on Cameo is New Jack. <laughs> Can I play you some audio of New Jack? I if, as long as we can't get sued for it, go ahead. I think we're in the clear, but let's uh try this out. Yo, this is New Jack, the original gangster. And I'm sending a special shout out to Nick. I heard you broke your leg. Well, Nick, you should try this Astro Glide. I use it on my wife all the time, and it works. Put a little bit on your ankle, and you'll be able to glide down the stairs, you clumsy motherfucker. Get well, bro. Peace. <laughs> Ah, well, that's that's New Jack. That's New Jack. Here's another one from New Jack. Yo, this is New Jack, the original gangster. Yo, George, I heard it was your 65th birthday. I also heard you was a fireman. Thanks for your services. I also heard you like OJ. <laughs> Free like OJ all day. Keep up the good work, baby. Peace. Another one from New Jack, and uh, but, but 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 color, can you turn the radio down? <laughs> and here's another one from New Jack. Yo, this is New Jack, the original gangster, and I want to send a special shout out to Kevin from Derek. Happy birthday, and I hope you're hiding big grimes, cause I toss his ass and I toss your ass too. Peace. <laughs> i tried to kill that motherfucker and i'll fuck with you too but hey peace uh here's some new ones that are apparently up let's see uh what this is new jack the original gangster and i'm stopping by to give a special shout out to ruthless ravi connor the fourth best comedian in canada well i heard you got jokes well i got a joke for you what if I stick this in your ass and twist it? That'd be real funny. And then if that don't work, I take my fucking crossbow and bust you in your motherfucking eye. <laughs> yeah, that's real funny. Ain't it really? Ha ha. Very funny, motherfucker. From New Jack. Peace. <laughs> and uh, you can't see the visual, but he holds up some spectacular looking knife as well as a crossbow right to the camera. All righty then. So if New Jack could do it, I'm looking at the list of some of the guys here. Mick Foley's now on Cameo. Brett the Hitman Hart. Hacksaw Duggan. Tito Santana. Kurt Angle. Barry Horowitz. Ricky Morton, who's wearing an Enzo Amore t-shirt in what appears to be his backyard. The Million Dollar Man. Of course, Darby Allen. I mean, everyone's doing this now. Any consideration? Uh, well, I just at some point when I have time. It's 30 seconds. Brian, <laughs> what what happened when I put up a an action figure? It broke the internet. Broke 500 the of them sold in an hour. What happened when I put out a limited edition, a limited edition, a limited ignition or a limited edition or any of those graphic novel, 1500 copies? Sold him three and a half days. If I was to say that I was going to, and I'm not going to gouge people and charge a ridiculous amount of money that some people might pay, yes, but I wouldn't feel good about it for, for a minute of video or whatever. I have to make it to where the average person would be able to get this realistically if, they, if it was something they wanted and not be a prick about it. And then what happens if, okay, then they'll I say, okay, go ahead and order your cameo. And I've got 700 one minute things to do in the, in the next day. What, what, what then would I do? I don't know. Well, there you go. See, you got to think these things through. You got to do a lot of thinning to get as far as I've gotten, Brian. That's why I'm here and you're over there. And the rest of these people are way down there because I do a lot of thinning. All right. Well. There it is for everyone who has asked to once again try to get Jim Cornette on Cameo. We have attempted. I'm not opposed to the idea. I just, I have to, I'm taking time in January, as I mentioned, I'm closing the store. Because do you realize the things that I have neglected in my personal life, not the ball shaving? Boy, I wish Manscaped had sponsored. We get so, every segue goes to shaving your balls. 
But I mean, I've got I've got around the castle here. Four of the six bulbs in my ceiling lights in the office have been blown for some time, and I have not changed them. And I had uh, people are going, oh, hey, fuck you, you just changed the light. But no, it's the, the I can't reach them. So you got it's one of those things you got to go and get the ladder and set the ladder up and climb up and down and do these things. And I haven't had time to do that. I'm going to enjoy a nice, peaceful month to myself. We're going to record these programs. I'm going to do my puttering around the house. And and then maybe one of these days I'll have time to do Cameo. What would be an affordable price, a, a reasonable price, a, a legitimate price for some service of that nature? I have no idea. What do you think you would do, 30 seconds or a minute? Well, it seems, well, I don't know. It depends on the person. How much material do they give me? What what do I know about these people? What do my Because here's the it, thing. What do my investigations return to me? What kind of facts about these people do I have to get Stephen P. New to get his investigators on these people to give me background to talk about? There will be some people who literally want you to just say, you know, hi, I heard it's your birthday, happy birthday. But then I think a lot of people are going to say, hey, fuck you. A lot of people are going to specifically want you to cut a promo on someone or something. Yeah. And that's where People are going to lose their minds, and everyone's going to jump on this thing. I mean, I'm looking at some of these other ones. Britt Baker is a hundred bucks. What? So you have to be far bigger than that. No, but no. See, now I can't. No, I can't. In good conscience, for a minute of video, charge somebody a hundred dollars for a, you to cut a promo. These promos that- were used to drive people into buildings. I think a hundred dollars is low. I think it has to be much higher than that. Well, I don't. That's- Tatanka. <laughs> Tatanka, a hundred dollars. Uh, no, no, the wrestling gonna, promo Tatanka. Not even going to get started there. But well, maybe then after the pandemic, people. I'm not going to have people frivolously spending their money that they should be be spending toward rent and food and clothes and their children in a middle of a pandemic to just have me say, you know, fuck you and feed your fish heads on on the phone. How much do you think Jerry Lawler charges? Well, I do not know now that you've phrased it that way. $150. $300. No! See? Oh, good And here's Lord. an example. Let me give you an example of something that Jerry Lawler does. Hey, Jude. It's me, Jerry the King Lawler. That's right. WWE Hall of Famer Jerry the King Lawler. Look at I'm standing here in front of a, a picture of the Beatles which was always my all-time favorite singing group because, you know what? They did a song called Hey Jude. I'm sure you've heard that, right? Huh? Yeah, that's awesome, man. And listen, I just wanted to come along here because I understand that, well, Thursday, Thanksgiving Day, was your birthday. You turned six years old. That is awesome, Jude. And your mom and Lewis told me that, and I just wanted to come along here and say happy birthday. And you know what? I'm going to be expecting a happy birthday from you because day after tomorrow is my birthday. That's right. The King's birthday is November 29th. We're both Sagittarians. Isn't that cool? Well, listen, I understand that you love WWE and you even decided to, you decided to skip out on a trip to Disney to go to a WWE show. That's awesome. And I understand that you got, you got my action figures. Which one you got? Let me see. Check this out up here, Jude. See all those up there? <laughs> Which one of those do you have? Apparently the king used news investigators on his kid. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll show you one of my all-time favorites. What's it was it one of my first security action number, figures. King? It was one How long does this go? In, a, in a pack with my son Brian, Christopher. Check this out. Yeah, see that? That was a while back. WWF. <laughs> We're not allowed to say that anymore, Jude. But anyway... Wanted to say once again, very, very happy birthday to you. I know you'll have a great year. Man, turning six years old, that is so exciting. And I know what? I know how much you love WWE. Maybe, maybe, Jude, one of these days you'll grow up and be a WWE superstar, and I'll get to call your matches. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, that'd be great. And, you know, when you're at it, maybe you just might go back and win a couple of these. And I was showing yeah, the belts. A couple of belts. Give him the ramp. AWA World, World Tag Team titles <laughs> that I won back in 1987. And this is the AWA World Heavyweight Championship belt that I won from Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning, in 1988. So that's probably in your future. And but stole you know from what? Vern. If you don't want to be a wrestler, you can always be 
a superhero like oh my, my friend God. Soup. Superman, I call him Soup. <laughs> or you can be, if you're going to be a big, big, strong guy and need all your vegetables and everything, you might be as big as this guy. Nine and a half foot tall, incredible Hulk. <laughs> okay, maybe this is worth $300. Listen, you, you become a superhero. you got to come down to Memphis, Tennessee. That's where I live. And you know what I'll do? It doesn't end. I'll take you and I for a ride in my car. Check my car out right here. Look at this, dude. You see that? Hey, look at these my pictures in my wallet, Jude. Yeah. It's the Batmobile. <laughs> How cool would you and I look driving around Memphis, waving at all the people in the Batmobile, huh, Jude? All right. Well, listen. Happy birthday. I know you had a happy birthday. And you know what's He's next? He's about to have another one. <laughs> oh, yes. Be good, Jude, because this guy is always watching. Okay? I know you had a happy birthday. Now I hope you have a Merry Christmas, Jude. From Mom, Lewis, and the King. And there it is, three hundred dollars. I booked Lawler to wrestle one time, paid him five hundred dollars. The match wasn't that long. <laughs> See, that's that. That is longer than I have talked to anyone on the phone that I want to talk to in the last year and a half. I never get to talk to anybody I want to talk to on the phone. I'm always talking to you. How much but do you think? That, how much do you think Flair charges? I I have no idea. How much is a bottle of Dom Perignon these days? It's a little less than that. Five hundred dollars he charges. Ouch! Let's hear this. Hey, today's boy here, and this is a very special one. Just in the nick of time, <laughs> Jimmy Albertini, get married tomorrow, man, and wow, you're beautiful. I mean. On beautiful, smoking hot, fiance Christina wanted me to tell you that she is so damn excited to marry you, she can't stand it. That she loves you very much, and that in her whole lifetime, she never dreamed she'd be marrying an original limousine riding, jet flying. Kiss feeling, wheeling, dealing, styling, and profiling. Son of a gun. Like you, Jimmy. Imagine that. She loves you, man. You're getting married tomorrow. Woo, the honeymoon's on. God bless you, man. Much happiness to both of you. Much respect to you, Christina, for having me tell Jimmy he's a lucky guy because you are smoking, baby. Woo! Congratulations, Jimmy and Christina from the Nature Boy. Woo! Walk it out. But now, wait a minute. Here's the thing. Lawler, Lawler's not only sounded like he had a crew come in and shoot it, but he's on set with cars and superheroes and championship belts and crowns and all these things he's talking about and then flair comes in and sounds like neil armstrong has just stepped foot on the moon <laughs> it's one small step for christina and this another small step for uh scuba tank rick flair yeah scooby, he was he was scuba scoop scooby-doo how much do you think jake the snake charges well it depends on do, does he measure this by the gram or <laughs> Or by the minute. Jake charges $100, and this one's labeled a pep talk. Let's hear this. Hey, Gavin. Jake the Snake Roberts here. You know, I got this request, man, and um, I'm just going to give it to you straight. I've given this out several times because these are tough times, man. This pandemic's got everybody screwed up. It's ripped me off. It's ripped you off. It's taken from everyone. So here's the thing, man. You've got a plan. See, that's the most important thing. You and your uncle have a plan. You got a good product. You're getting it out there. And the plan is to keep going, keep moving. But to keep moving, you've got to be positive, man. You can't take no for an answer. No, no, no. You ain't taking no. Hell no. The answer is yes. 
Yes, you want this salad. Yes, you want to buy this. Yes, I'm glad you're here. Yes, business is good. Yes, I feel good. You got to stay positive. Negativity brings down anybody, man. You walk around negative, you might as well put a sign on your forehead, loser. Because you're not going to accomplish shit. You know why? Because you'll give up. You'll pussy out. Man, you don't want to go down like that, do you? I know I wouldn't. You got to trust your uncle, man. You know? Go give him a big hug, man, and say, I believe, man, because you got to believe with all your heart, man. You got to reach up and grab what you want off this earth. And you won't do it by doubting what you're doing. If you doubt, you might as well just stick your finger up your ass and say, I'm a loser, man. I'm done. You don't want to do that, do you? All right. Man, make it work. Make it work. Be proud of what you're doing. Do it the best of your ability, and I promise you, your reward will be greater than you've ever expected. I know about being positive, man. I've been down and out before. You haven't. I've been stretched out, laid out, given up on. Yeah, but I still got my... Uh, and then it cut off. Oh, well, I've been cut off. <laughs> and still I kept coming and kept talking. Even his pep talk Even is somewhat when depressing. nobody was listening. You know, uh, by the way, does this highlight how insane they are that Jake Roberts is managing Lance Archer and is not the leader of the dork order? And well, it, he, just, he doesn't talk. Have, we never hear him talk at all, really. All they would have had to do is just sit him in a fucking dark room and pre tape and let him be the leader of the door of the dark order and not even come to the ring and just do all the string pulling. And and they would might have had something. And then, well, then, of course, then he would have said, well, don't put any of these people in this group because they're all job guys, except for the, you know, maybe one is. But yeah. <laughs> Of course, now, the problem is that guy he was giving that pep talk to is, is actually a guy, the guy that pumps out my septic tank, and his uncle is taking advantage of him, taking it, ripping him off for everything he's got. I mentioned Tatanka charges $100. Oh, boy. Here's Tatanka. Oh, please. All right. Native American superstar. Hello, everyone. It's Native America Tatanka. First of all, I want to give a big shout out to Trey. But we want to deal with something first, and that is Cole, your brother. Cole, you know that Trey loves the Native America Tatanka. You also know that he wanted to have me at his wedding. I was looking forward to it, but I never got that special invite. You know why? Because you want to save the wampum, like the Native America Tatanka would say. Trying to save money and being cheap, and instead, you get in this cameo video for $100. I cannot believe you, but getting serious, hey, Trey, happy birthday, which is today. And again, what Tatanka would always say, believe in your dreams, and also your brother Cole wanted to make sure that you knew that you are loved very much. Again, it's Native Tatanka. Cole, you better watch out. If you mess up again with your brother, Tatanka could get that war cry going, that war dance going, and before you know it, the tomahawk chop is coming, and you're going down one, two, three. It's Tatanka. Peace. I'm out. That was Tatanka. I know. No, I would have never have known that now, was Tatanka. He's wearing the not headdress. Not seem. He's wearing the headdress. He has a tomahawk, but he did not do the war chant. I was expecting that. I was too, but I was also expecting him to break into. If you smell what Tatanka <laughs> is, why is he talking? Of did he used to refer to himself in the third person? No. I'm trying to remember any notable Tatanka interviews, but... Um, well, get back with me on that. Yeah, I can't remember too many of those. I remember one time... One of the times 
that he left the, the WWF. He was on an airplane and apparently not only was he talking to God, but God was speaking back to him. And then he went away for a while. I don't know what happened after that. <laughs> okay. I was wondering where you were going with that. No, he, no, really, you know, because a lot of people crack up and start talking to God. Oh, God, if I ever get out of this, help me. To, but no, God was answering him and they were having a back and forth conversation. And then he got out of wrestling for a while. <laughs> okay, here's one more, at least for you. No, I'm not. I'm not complaining. This is classic stuff. Well, then maybe more maybe than I, one. Maybe I should jack my price up here in some of this. How much do you think Baron Von Raschke charges? <laughs> it can't be enough. I love the Baron. <laughs> Whatever he is charging, it can't be enough. One hundred and thirty dollars for the Baron. And 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 that's the the Baron probably was thinking like me. He was like, I can't go because one hundred and thirty. That's an odd amount. He's like. I can't char charge 135. It's not worth it. Well, here's Baron Von Raschke wishing someone a happy birthday. Hi, little Lily. I got word from your parents, your mom and your dad, that sometimes you have a little bit of an attitude. Well, sometimes Baron Von Raschke has a little bit of an attitude. And you know what I do when people are bugged by me? I show him the claw. <laughs> I think it'd be a good idea, Ellie, when you, your parents are telling you, change your attitude and behave. You've got to mind your parents, but you can always give them the claw and a giggle. How about that? And uh, I want to wish you on your birthday coming up, Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear Ellie! From your new friend, The Claw! And a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year! Ha ha ha! Ellie, that's all your parents need to know! I'm thinking maybe this kid's parents bought this to entertain themselves. Because I think they might have. I'm not sure that little Ellie's old enough to remember the Baron. But also, I'm just thinking I'm transposing that audio with the image of the poster that I have up on uh, in the vault here of the old Bob Luce programs from Chicago. There's the picture of Baron Von Raschke. It says, hate ape, beast of Berlin. And he's like, happy birthday to you. Uh, the Baron is the nicest man in the world. He's the only person I did the I did the straight shooting series. I did all the kayfabe commentaries, interviews. He's the only person that didn't knock anybody throughout the in course of uh, the course of the entire interview. I'm looking at some of the prices here for modern wrestlers. John Silver from the Dark Order, fifty seven dollars. <laughs> fifty seven dollars. Kevin Nash. Well, he's not a wait. modern wrestler, but one hundred and five dollars. Leo. Now Rush. wait a minute. Hold on a second. Now. Yeah. Just, just pump the brakes. You mean to tell me that Kevin Nash is charging less than Baron Von Raschke? He indeed is. That doesn't seem like that uh, a man with Kevin Nash's business sense with some of these other amounts you've been bandying around and the level of star that he is, seems like that he would be charging more. I guess it is surprising when you put it that way. Maybe he just does a shit job and doesn't even look up like he does at autograph sessions. Or he just takes the thing in front of him. It's like, hi, Bill. Good luck. See ya. Well, let's uh, let's find out now that you brought that up. Here oh, is, is, is there a sample on? Of, here's of a that sample old? of Kevin Nash. Well, you don't think they're going to put any of the ones that suck real bad up here, do you? I think it's the most recent ones that are available here on uh, Cameo. But let's uh, go to this one. Hey, it's Kevin Nash. I uh, wanted to wish you a happy birthday along with your uh, wife and daughters, Nikki and Brittany. I uh, heard you're a huge wrestling fan, especially uh, of the NWO back in the 90s, and uh, especially of Scott and I, which I greatly appreciate. Um, your wife said that uh, you named your bowling team uh, at the time after the NWO, which is too sweet. So... Um, I do a lot of these, um, and one thing I've tried to say this year for anybody that's uh, got a birthday wish is as crazy as 2020 has been with the ups and downs and, and uh, the heartbreak and sorrow that, that, that families have, have felt, 
you know, that you got to live your life and you've got to, you know, appreciate this day because this is the day that you were born. It's the day that you came on this earth. And I know that uh, your wife, Nikki, and your and your two daughters, they, they'd love you to death or they wouldn't have put this together. So hopefully this, uh, this vaccine gets to us all. We get through this and we get back to normal normal. I'm not I'm not playing the new normal. I'm I'm with the normal normal. I want the I want the old the old times back. So hang in there, have the best of birthdays that you can. Stay safe, stay healthy. God bless. Take care, my man. Well that was nice. Well he sounded excited. Well he didn't sound excited, uh, but he sounded genuine. Yeah. Was was he was he sitting near the interstate? You know, I was wondering if he was driving himself because he was wearing a seatbelt and it appeared the car was shaking, but I think his phone was shaking as he was holding it. But there were other cars in the background going by. I think he was parked on the side of the road doing this. What? Which speaks to how easy it is Wait a minute. to do this. Wait a minute. But how would this be so urgent that he pulled over on the side of the road to do this specific thing? Go where you're going and then knock them all out. Or you think he was just sitting there at a rest area just to... Maybe it, it's just that everybody from my generation is more bored than I am and needs people to talk to. Maybe. And I'll tell you what, we're going to return to these in a moment. But first, I want to say for everyone out there wishing there was a Jim Cornette cameo, there isn't right now. However, if you have a collection of Jim Cornette photos, you can put them <laughs> on your skylight frame. No, here's where you are. Here's where you are right on target here, because that's exactly what you ought to do, ladies and gentlemen. You ought to get a collection of pictures and download them to your skylight frame, and you can look at all of them at the same time. And it don't cost anywhere near these five hundreds of dollars or even more than that we're, we've been talking about being bandied around here. The folks at, at, at Skylight Frame... Make it easy, effortless to set up. Takes about a minute. You plug it in. Use the touch screen to connect to your wireless network. All you people know how to do that. I'm the only person that doesn't know how to do that anymore. Uh, but we've talked about the one that Brian has sitting there of all of his favorite Mets players and plus great moments of his life down through history. You can... <laughs> Buy one of these skylight frames. You can load it up with pictures and you can send it to a beloved family member or friend or loved one, or you can just keep it in your own home and they can send you pictures or vice versa. And, and we've even talked about the candid photography potential involved here because it is a pandemic and some people may be closed down away from each other and, and feeling the need to see more of another significant person. Well, you can do all that kind of stuff with these things because the internet is wonderful. And it's 100% satisfaction guaranteed. If you don't love the Skylight Frame, they offer you a full refund. So once again, whether it's family pictures, friends' pictures, pets' pictures, whoever, you can keep this frame and you can have people send pictures to you. You can send it to people and have them send more pictures to those people. It's, it's an incredible thing, for heaven's sake. And... As a special offer right now, $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E. How in the world else would you spell it? Skylightframe.com and use the promo code DRIVE. $10 off one of these bad boys just because you know us. Skylightframe.com with the promo code DRIVE. That's what we need more of around here. That's right. A fantastic gift, even for yourself. Yes. And and actually, the gifts for yourself are usually the most fulfilling because you know exactly what you want. Exactly. They're the best gifts to get, the ones you buy yourself. Yes. And charity begins at home. Well, you know, some people may want to get the gift of a cameo from Miro. Oh, no. How much do you think that costs? Well, however much it, it would be uh, overpriced, but let's let's say fit it, three fifty. Well, you were close. Just divide it by half, one hundred and twenty-five. <laughs> and also, I'm noticing here, and I didn't wait, notice this wait, before. Wait, wait a minute! Wait a minute! What? For, for all the fucking grade school graduates, 
in the crowd. We're not going to let that one go by. I said three fifty, and you said, "Well, just split it in half." And what figure did you say? Oh shit! You know what? <laughs> I didn't even realize it. I said one hundred and twenty-five. Yeah. Don't 175. don't you edit right. that out, Jason? I'll leave it in. We'll leave it in. Jason Nebuchadnezzar, I order you not to edit that. <laughs> well, the thing I just noticed, yeah, is that Miro charges one hundred and twenty-five for the videos, and I guess the other guys do this too. I didn't notice it, but it's two dollars and ninety-nine cents to chat with him. How what? How is this much time in the day? I don't know, but here's Miro. But these people have time to chat with people. I'm not saying that 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 these people are bad people to chat with, but who has this much time? Here's Miro. Dor Vetur, Galena, Asamiro. Znam, že jsme se viděli druhý den. Možná, da, viděli jsme se. Did they ask for this to be in a foreign language? I didn't know this was going to be what it was. Ne, no, moje to show to, za kdo to je bohužel. But now. I'm switching to another language so everybody can understand. Oh, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> I want to say congratulations to you, Galena Chistito, for your uh, graduation at uh, this little university. Um, what is it called again? Oh, yeah, Harvard, by the way. <laughs> I mean, this is unbelievable. You know, to be honest, and I'll speak English. This is just whatever. Like growing up, I have only heard of one college, and that's uh, Harvard. I have never, I've never heard of anything else. And really? knowing what? that you, a fellow <laughs> Bulgarian, is graduating Harvard, um, I mean, it's just mind blowing. I think this is such a such a great accomplishment, uh, not just your, for yourself, but actually for a whole nation. Because there's, I don't think there's that many Bulgarians or people in the world. Outside of American people that graduated Harvard, so Nowinski, uh, congratulations for that, and, <laughs> and you should be very proud. Your family, I'm sure, it's it's really really proud, and uh, and everybody just it, it's just an amazing accomplishment. And thank you for being a huge fan again, and for coming to the event and waving the Bulgarian flag, and that means a lot to me. And to know uh, that uh, you know my fellow Bulgarians are a fan, it's not just of me, but the sport in general. Well, sports entertainment in general. Oh, for um, God's sake! Thank you very much. He's again. correcting himself uh, on a fucking camera. I'm looking forward to actually seeing photos of your graduation <laughs> and seeing you walking that thing. I'm I'm sure it's going to be a special moment, and uh, I'm, and in, for you to do it in an ear like this, uh, you know, it's. I mean, it's just kudos to you because you know a lot of people. Uh, are down and out and they're hurt or whatnot, but you kept going and you're actually going to graduate Harvard once again. That's just unbelievable. Uh, that speaks so highly of you and how strong of a person you are. Um, and thank you again uh, for doing that, Galena. And Ben loves you very much and Ben booked this and he's really proud of you. And, um, and I'm just looking forward to seeing those graduation pictures. Congratulations once again. Um, and go watch AEW now. Goodbye. Maybe maybe they can put those uh, graduation pictures in a skylight frame and send them on over to Miro. If his mind is blown by the fact that she's graduating Harvard, wait until he finds out about Yale. <laughs> he never heard of any other college? Any other college? What, a, what about, for heaven's sake, what about the University of Phoenix? <laughs> Jim? How much do you think Brandon Cutler charges? No. You are not trying to tell me that he's on there. Brandon Cutler, pro wrestler, AEW wrestler, AEW executive producer of content, oh dungeon my. master, building the bridge between wrestling and Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, my God. Oh, my. There, does there need to be a bridge built? <laughs> Between wrestling and Dungeons and Dragons. So he basically he's his profile is I'm a nerd that doesn't get laid and I got my job because my friends have a company. How much does he charge? $17.50.
Close. $25. <laughs> I don't even know what this guy sounds like, so I'm going to play one of these for a second. And He's actually done what somebody requested one. There's a few of them here. Let's hear this. What's up, Brian? Brandon Cutler here from AEW. Want to wish you a happy birthday. 40 on the 4th. Heck yeah. What else is for? Oh, you know what else is for? My win streak. Four matches in a row ever since I defeated Peter. I've gotten four. Let's see. Hopefully by your birthday on December 4th. Hopefully I've cranked up to five. Let's see. Boom, boom. Happy birthday, Ryan. And that's $25 from Brandon Cutler. Wow. Well, he got what he paid for. Old uh, happy birthday fellow there. Well, here's a tough one to figure out. How much do you think the Russian nightmare Nikita Koloff charges? Oh, je toi ta. Ooh, I, uh, $95. $40. $40? Well, the, now that's a fucking steal. Well, here's the other do question. Mean, do you think he does it in the Russian accent before we play any of these? I would say he starts in the Russian and drops it. Okay, let's let's find out. I'm not sure what he's going to do. Let's uh, play the most recent one posted here. And what a what a deal, by the way. Because you get an unheard of fucking clown that we just heard of. $25, $40 for the Russian nightmare Nikita Koloff. Well, 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 well. There's well, a I blew it already. going around, Chateau Etat, the Russian nightmare. <laughs> Nikita Koloff here. Now I'm looking for Brad Bailey. Ha, 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 ha. Hey, there's a rumor going around that, Brad, you're turning 40 on December 5th. Oh, my gosh. The big 4-0. Hey, bro, that's a big, big day in time. I remember my 40th birthday. I remember exactly where I celebrated it as well. That's a big deal. Hey, you got a lot of people that love you. I know your wife, Barbara, and you got some great friends that love you as well. And and they uh, requested this video for you is a special surprise for your birthday, your 40th birthday. I understand, too, you and your brother are big-time wrestling fans. I'm hoping, I'm hoping you're a Nikita Koloff fan. Now, you know, I can go, I know that can go either way, but uh, ne nevertheless, uh, Brad, man, I hope it's a special memory December 5th when you turn 40. I hope there's some other surprises that your lovely bride and all your wonderful friends who helped set this video up uh, will do for you. And that 40th birthday will be your most memorable birthday yet. And as I used to close out every interview, Brad, or many of them anyway, I'm coming for you, Jetoeta. <sighs> <laughs> Happy birthday, Brad. Well, now, now I'm curious. Does he do, does anyone request him just do the Russian accent? I just want to, I'm not going to well, play I all of these. I, I don't know. That's why I thought he might start in it than to go to, but he did it the other way around. He went, he started. Oh, he barely did it. That American doesn't count. That, that does that, not count. Let's, let's see. Well, he did, did a little bit at the end, but I just thought he was going to Brad, your wife. Maybe she'll do some other things for you. Maybe, maybe this, this time for your birthday, she'll swallow. Oh, God. you know, or where's that? I the would have Russian nightmare here, Nikita Koloff. No, once again, he's right into being the real guy. He's Scotty Simpson. He's not Nikita yeah. Koloff. This is disappointing. GQ ball. No, I. But but uh, I. I would. I'm. I would probably piss somebody off if I because I would. I would play with this and take liberties with people. I think you would probably be the most popular guy on here. Here's Russo. How much do you think Russo charges? <laughs> I'd say he probably will pay anybody that wants one fifty dollars. Fifty dollars, you nailed it. No, I said he'll pay anybody that oh. wants fifty dollars. <laughs> well, no, it's uh fifty dollars. How much do you think Ricky Morton is? I do not uh, say a hundred dollars. Thirty-seven dollars. What? It's a weird figure. Uh, that is that is a weird figure, and also these valuations are way off in my estimation. I mean, Lawler did a goddamn mini series for his three hundred dollars i can see that but you got nash is cheaper than one of these other yahoos and you got shit stain on the board at fifty dollars ahead of ricky morton good heavens how much do you think tito santana is sixty two dollars and seventy five cents twenty five dollars oh come on let's hear tito 
This is WWE Hall of Famer Tito Santana, all decked out wearing my Strike Force sweatshirt and my t shirt, getting ready to go do an appearance. And I want to thank you for booking this shout out. This means a lot to me. This is a shout out for Chad Webb. You and your buddy Leonard just started a webcast on YouTube called The Nitty Gritty. And obviously you discussed all my first nine WrestleMania matches and supposedly you ranked them. I am so proud to say that only Hulk Hogan and myself are the first or the only two guys to be on the first nine WrestleManias. So that is quite an accomplishment. I'm not in the same level as Hulk Hogan. I could have been, but I'm not. <laughs> uh, but I was the first match on WrestleMania and that'll stand forever. I want to wish you a lot of luck with your new webcast in YouTube. And I also want to wish you a Merry Christmas and your wife, Steph, and your three children. Have a very Merry Christmas and good luck with your new adventure, teaming up with Leonard Hayhurst. Arriba! There it is. Okay, maybe $25 is about right. <laughs> Hacksaw Duggan, how much? Oh, he's got to be $150. $75. What? That's a deal. Everybody should get a Hacksaw Duggan cameo then, because that's just ridiculously cheap. All right, this may be the last one we check out. Let's hear this. Oh, hey, Chris. Oh, excuse me. Hey, Jonesy. I'm WWE Hall of Famer. Hacksaw Jim Duggan from the golden age of wrestling. But I know you know that tough guy being a wrestling guy. Anyway, Jonesy, I got a special message for you from your wife, Erin. Yeah. So you might want to sit down, buddy, because you know Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I'm going to give this to you straight. She wants me to tell you Bye. Merry Christmas, buddy. <laughs> Congratulations, my friend. Sounds like you guys got a great, great relationship. She says you're an amazing husband and father and an amazing overall good person. So nice to hear, man. Very good, brother. And I guess you were a wrestling fan back in the day and still watch the shows. But that was the golden age. Hogan, Macho Man, Jake the Snake, Junkyard Dog. You can still name 10 guys without thinking about it. Hopefully, Jonesy, you have the WWE Network. And if you do, sit the family down over the holidays and check out Legend House, the reality show, where Roddy Piper's my roommate. So the company, they were expecting a drama. <laughs> they ended up getting the comedy. I could pull off any practical joke I wanted to and blame it on Piper, man. Sounds like the relationship uh, you have with your wife and family, man. So good to hear, man. <laughs> you know, so nice. Anyway, buddy, when you see the wife, give her a big hug and kiss and keep on to the mistletoe. Anyway, Jonesy, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to you and the family. And this hoes for you, Jonesy. Ho, ho, ho! And thanks for being a wrestling fan, buddy. Merry Christmas. <laughs> well, there it is. That was nice. That's the, Hacksaw. That's Duggan. The banging you heard was seemingly him and his two-by-four. He has a two-by-four with him, and he's just throwing it around as he's talking. I lied. That's not the last one. This is the last one. All right, all right. They're, they're, they're like potato chips. How much do you think formerly known as Enzo Amore charges? Oh, good Lord. He probably wants to charge $1,000 and nobody's ever got one. He charges $95 and appears a lot of people have gotten some. And I have to say, this guy is a great promo. I'm sure these are entertaining. Let's check this out. Here's Enzo, or I don't know if we're allowed to call him Enzo. Well, Enzo, N-Z-O is that he now types his name in. Here's Enzo. What were we, Enzo, man? About a boom real gay and a woman. 
Hey, Dom. Now, I got to give a special shout out to NNW. Bada boom, real is E Fed in the room. How you doing? If we're talking about E Feds, this is the one, all right, people? You're on Twitch, you're watching other stuff, you need to make the switch. Vampire Epico, this is what we talking about. How you doing? Bada boom, realest guy in the room, Enzo Amore in the house. Well, that was in and out. What the f- well, hold on. I, I gotta see if another one makes any sense. This is uh here's another one. What do we got over here? Bada boom! <laughs> Realest guy in a room, how you doing? Hey Chris Ellison. Rumor has it you're a certified G in a bona fide stud. And you can't teach that, but do me a favor. Pass it along to your daughter Tegan. Your wife Che loves you. You guys, congratulations on the house. Bada boom. Realist rooms all over the house. All over the house. You got the realest house on a block, guys. Congratulations. All right. And uh do me a favor. You know, you're raising up that kid. She's gonna be beautiful. Just make sure that she's not S A W F T Soft. How you doing? Well, there's another one from Enzo. Mm. He's what, what you know your... what I'd like to do. I'd like to, I'd like to do one. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Your lovely wife Daphne asked me to send this message along to you. You know, there's been a pandemic for the last year. People have been trying to take care of their family, but she found out because she's been going through your phone that you've been diddling a stripper, pal. So <laughs> let me tell you something. <laughs> Whenever you get finished watching this little phone message, you ought to go down there to your bedroom and you ought to open that door and you ought to see that she ain't there no more. The bed's made and her bags are packed. You ought to go down to your kid's room. They ain't there anymore either. You ought to get online. You ought to look at your bank account. The balance is zero because fucker, you got caught and now you're fucked. That's what I'd do. That's $500 right there. $500. See, I think, I wonder if there's tears. Can you charge, this is Jim Cornette just cutting something. This is Jim Cornette in a suit. I, that should be a higher price. Wait a minute, now what, I'm like staying? I gotta have five grand extra to paint my face? I think it's warranted in this situation. Don't you? You have to put on that to, suit. I, I, haven't, I haven't worn a suit in over a year. I don't want to wear a suit again. Exactly. There has to be a premium placed <laughs> on that. That's my point. Do I have to wear pants? No, if, I've if, not if, seen if anyone. If the shot pants. is from the waist up, then I shouldn't really have to wear pants. You can go full Shivani here. Have a party there you downstairs. Go. One last one from Enzo. Well, what do we got over here? Bada boom, realest guy in the room. How you doing? I'm smack talking Skywalker. I got a microphone lightsaber for right. All right, we got over here. Cup of haters. We got a cup of haters. No, it's just some bitch named Akeem who thinks that fucking heaven is a place on earth. Thinks that the Tennessee Titans are ever gonna win a fucking football game with Ryan Tannehill at starting quarterback. Okay, I remember the Titans back when Denzel Washington was their fucking coach. Maybe they won. Maybe he'd win a game. Maybe he got Denzel in there. All right, but fucking, you know, Ryan Tannehill. Okay. You guys couldn't even win a game when you had the fastest fucking player in the history of the NFL run a 40 out there. Chris Johnson had his 40 time on a fucking, on a, on a, on a stopwatch, on an ice chain. I mean, he was a legend. And not even with a legend like that could you guys ever win a chip. You know what I mean? I remember the Titans. I remember when they lost to the Rams by one fucking yard. That's what you are. You're too short. Just, just, just not quite there yet. All right, pal? You know, hop off Corey Davis's dick, all right? Because dick riding ain't no form of transportation, and you ain't getting fucking nowhere, all right, being a Titans fan. I'll tell you that right now, Akeem. Beyond that, Akeem, Akeem the fucking dream, fucking, you know, you know, happy fucking birthday, all right? <laughs> and there he is, Enzo Amore, or Enzo did, now. Did Denzel Washington used to be a football coach? In the movie, Remember the Titans. Oh, see, I didn't see that movie. Either did I, but I think he yeah. was in it. A lot of other people didn't see it either. No, but there it is. Some of the spectacular wrestlers on Cameo. Everyone from Ted DiBiase down to the Sandman. And Jim, we've said it before. You're not on Cameo currently. We don't know if this will ever happen. But a lot of fans want an experience with Jim Cornette. And while they can't talk to you or have you cut a promo on them on Cameo, they could potentially have a painting made of them with you perhaps both of you in suits that way you don't actually have to wear one but in painting form you will be there in your suit 
That's right, because now with the pandemic, it's killed all the meet and greets. I'm never going to a convention again because now I know how germs are transferred around and I'm freaking the fuck out. So if you want to have a picture taken with me, what you do is you have a picture of yourself and you have a picture of me and you get them put together in a painting from the folks that paint your life. That's exactly what you do. That's a, as a matter of fact, that's a good idea, Brian. You're using your your head for more than just a hat rack. More than just math. More than just math. That's <laughs> right. You're, you're branching out into social studies and science and a little PE, whatever. Anyway, I actually, I've been wanting to read this email because I got an email from a fine young woman from Pennsylvania named Shay. And Shay writes, and there's going to be a point to this here in a second. Shay writes, Dear Jim, I've been wanting to write you for a while, and after hearing you talk about significant others complaining about having to listen to you, I wanted to make sure my portion of the demographic is known as well. I am a married mother of two young children, and my husband does not listen to you. He and I are both wrestling fans, but he's not the person who got me into wrestling, and I'm pretty sure I drive him crazy by constantly saying, well, Cornette said on the podcast, blah, blah, blah. But the reason I've been wanting to write you for so long is to thank you for your podcast as they have brought me so much joy and laughter over the past couple of years. My mama died un uh, two years ago unexpectedly, and I was in such a deep depression that I struggled to get through a day without dwelling on the heartache. That's when I found your podcast, desperate to take my mind off of her as she was not a wrestling fan. What started as a quick distraction became my favorite part of the week. I excitedly anticipate the new episodes of the drive through and the experience to drop every week and listen while at work or while cooking dinner at night. You and Brian have helped me through so many dark moments and even helped me find paint your life. So I was able to get a photo of, Ma of mama with my niece that was born a month after she passed. So thank you for all you guys do and continue to do. And that's Shay in Pennsylvania. And that's for all the people out there who are thin thinning that we were just saying this stuff. And, and Shay, we appreciate you. Appreciate you listening. Sorry for your loss. But you can actually do this. This is not just a marketing gimmick. Bring your generations of your families together with people that weren't even together or alive in the same era with Paint Your Life. They take a picture or any selection of pictures, numerous pictures, and they can combine them, different pictures from different times, and bring everybody together, whether it's family members, whether it's friends, whether it's multiple generations, pets that are gone, whatever the case. It's a professional hand-painted portrait from a team of world-class artists at an affordable price. You go to paintyourlife.com. It's a quick and easy process. Once you work with them on the details, get everything set, then you can get the portrait in about three weeks, and you will... Have it forever. And if you don't love the final painting, your money's refunded. So paintyourlife.com. If you don't love the final painting, the money is refunded. It's guaranteed. And right now is a limited time offer. You can get 20% off and free shipping. To get this special offer, text the word DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, to 64,000. DRIVE to 64,000, which is, of course, as we all know, Six and four with three zeros behind it. We've had questions on this before. Drive to 64,000, 20% off free shipping on a Paint Your Life painting. Celebrate the moments that matter most. Well, Jim, we'll see what the Cult of Cornet thinks about you potentially getting on Cameo, but let's get some questions in. This was sent to Corny Drive Through at gmail.com from Chris in Liverpool, England. As well as your two great shows, I also listen to John Arezzi and Brian's podcast at the moment. They're in October of 1990, and the lead-up to Halloween Havoc. There's loads of great tag teams in WCW at the time, and that pay-per-view is tag match heavy with some potentially great matches. I just wanted to know your thoughts on the Nasty Boys and the big push they got when coming to WCW. They looked a bit heavy-handed, <laughs> and rough around the edges, but didn't seem bothered whether it was job guys or the Steiners they were being stiff with. Surely, they must have had trouble with the Steiners, as I don't imagine the Nasties could back up working so stiff. Also, what did you think about them jumping to the WWF so quickly? Were you surprised Vince brought them in and also pushed them to the world title? 
Well, okay, multiple part question here. First of all, um, I th the nasties at that time, there was probably the the heyday of the nasties because they were heavy handed and they fit the gimmick that they had. And shortly, well, I don't say shortly, but after they got to the WWF and got settled in and got broken of, of most of what made them the nasty boys in the ring, they were still the nasties outside the ring, but they couldn't work like that and do that shit anymore. And also they started getting hurt and started getting heavier. Uh, so I wasn't there for much of the nasties run in WCW because we left in October. Uh, Stan and I did at the end of October. They left right after that um, too. Well, as you know, yeah, th there you go. They probably, uh, they saw the writing on the wall with what was going on there as well. Well, if I could just jump in real quick, that was one of the big problems with WCW. Well, there were so many around that period of time, they brought the nasty boys in, pushed them to the match with the Steiners, never signed them to a contract. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I don't think that, I think the Steiners probably, you know, liked that kind of shit because they liked working with Doc and Gordy and all those other guys. They, you know, as long as you weren't dangerous and dropping somebody on their fucking head and hurting them, uh, Steiners didn't care if somebody was stiff and believable. So, but, um, you know, the Nasties were not a polished team, never got really polished, but they weren't polished then because they were so green and they were just, they worked their gimmick. And that's probably the best use of them. When they got smartened up and settled down, then it was just kind of, eh, to me. And you guys never worked with them? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. As a matter of fact, that Halloween Havoc was supposed to be Midnight and Rock and Roll, as you'll remember. To open the show. Well, we didn't care. At least it, we were miserable there. They weren't using us at all. This has been gone over many times. So at least we, we'd look forward to a show like that because, okay, we're going to be on pay-per-view. We're going to have the Rock and Roll Express. We'll have the best match of the night. The order of matches was not uh, set or quantified ahead of time. We just fair okay, we're going to work with the Rock and Roll in Chicago. It'll be great. And that's when... Robert had torn his ACL in his knee, so he was out. So it's Ricky Morton and Tommy Rich, who, all due respect to both of them, had never teamed up before, ever. And we not only go out and open the show, which this was before the idea was start the show off hot. When you jerked the curtain back then, you were jerking a fucking curtain. And with a makeshift tag team, and we were going to put them over. So we went out and... A pretty daggum good match with Ricky Morton and Tommy Rich and put him over. Uh, but it, that's I was still dwelling on that three or four days later. You know, the and that was the same night that Ole wanted me to put the pumpkin on my head. We're we, <laughs> we're fixing to we're fixing to work a program with the Southern Boys. So who was it? The Freebirds beat them, and then they fucking beat me up. So. And then we're going to start a program. So, yeah, I was still thinking about that four days ago when I told Ole, you know what? I'll be home. This but was that, the event where everyone played dress up, too. Yes, yes, yeah. And, and that's the one good thing about the whole fucking show is, and the pictures are still out there, but to, first of all, Tommy Rich and Ricky Morton beat us, beat the Midnight Express, right? One, two, three, middle of the ring, first match on the show. Then the Southern boys who were supposed to be starting to deal with her in like the third match against the Freebirds, as I mentioned, they're going to lose also because I'm going to go out dressed as a Confederate general and distract the Southern boys or whatever the fuck I did. I've put it out of my memory at this point. And this was, this was Ole's brainchild. And then the Southern boys would jerk me in the ring and, and not hospitalize me, give me all their finishes, but like beat me up or give me a couple of bumps or get even with me in some kind of way. So they bring me this Confederate general uniform. Janie Engel, love Janie to death. What a great girl she was. But she brings me the uniform. They've rented it because somebody actually thought of this a couple of days beforehand and they rented the fucking Confederate general's uniform in Atlanta. And she tells me, she says, whatever you do, make sure you, they don't tear it up because we got to take it back on Monday. Oh. Thanks for that piece of information. So I go sit down with the Southern boys, uh, Tracy and Steve Armstrong. And I said, boys, I said, 
when you get me in the ring, the first thing you do, grab this jacket and fucking peel it off of me from the back, split it up the middle, tear it right off of me. And they had heard the, oh, don't tear it because, you know, we got to take it back. And they said, are you sure? I said, oh, definitely. I said, if you don't do it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip it off myself. Because when I tried the fucking thing on, I'm trying to think now, where the pants were three sizes too big and the jacket was two sizes too small or vice versa. It didn't even fucking fit. Said what half of me couldn't bend and the other half was fucking swimming. So then I said, then turn me over your fucking knee and spank me. And I think I had him pop the pants loose too, or whatever the fuck, just as much destruction on this outfit as I could get. And then we come back, I come back from doing that bit and I changed it. And I went and handed the pieces to Janie. I said, here, we had a little trouble. I did. She wasn't going to get in any trouble for it. And I certainly was hoping that somebody would yell at me about it. But yeah, that was that was probably the stinker of all stinkers that we were involved in that night. So the Nasty Boys. Oh. It's an interesting time for WCW tag teams because Herd hates you and the Midnight Express. Yeah. But there's still some classic moments, you guys and the Southern. The ones. loyal guys that hung around, always had the best match, always tore the house down. Always were there, didn't fucking call in sick, didn't call in hurt, didn't switch the programs, blah, blah, blah. He hated us. You guys still had some great matches, though. Southern Boys, Steiner Brothers. He also brought in the Renegade Warriors. He brought in the Young Bloods. Yes, he did. Did you guys work Well, with actually, them? he didn't. He didn't well, bring Oli in anybody. Well, brought them in. Oli brought them in. <clears throat> yeah, Oli brought them in because, uh, obviously, Mark and Chris were Jay's younger brothers and obviously young blood was not their real name they were romero's they were uh, the sons and well it was all three sons i or think so of, yeah I, all three sons so. of ricky romero and who was a huge he was the biggest baby face in history of west texas not named funk and so and they were good workers in their own we may have had a television match or two with them or maybe something at a house show I can't remember, but we didn't get a chance to work with them very often. All right. Our next question sent the corny drive through at gmail.com from Rob in Washington, Illinois. I wondered if I can get your thoughts on CM Punk's statement about Pat McAfee being arguably the best heel in the business right now. And uh, there's a quote here. I'll read you this quote. Well, golly, I've got to disagree with that right off the bat, because that's the same thing we've been saying for the past several weeks. <laughs> Here's a uh, tweet from CM Punk's account. A lot of it has to do with the circumstance, but everyone else on the show should feel embarrassment and subsequently use said feeling to better themselves at the fact that Pat McAfee is a better promo than everyone on the show. Yeah. And when he went and did his podcast, which also has video, because he's got the big budget, he was wearing a neck brace the next day that he did his show after the pay-per-view. And he was talking about, how, yeah, he can't really turn his head and he's banged up. He's selling the effects of whether it's, that's the thing, whether, whether people know it's a work or not, it still looks like you're getting hurt, especially when some of them really are. So why not portray it that way instead of walking out like, I'm fine. So he, he wears a neck brace on the show. He puts the business and the, the toughness of it and the dangerousness of it over. He outperforms everybody when it comes to being a heel promo and pissing people off verbally. And and he's so far, he's he's held his own, even though they put him in that you know, uh, the garbage match that they, they just Pat McAfee. He had a great match with Adam Cole. That debut thing was great. He's got all that personality. They didn't need to put him in garbage matches his second time in. Cause that just devalues everything. But, but yeah, punk was right. Well, did you see somebody retweeted something that punk tweeted out in December of 2019, almost one year ago to the day. And it's aged very well. It was another picture of all the guys waiting to catch somebody diving. And he said, can we, something to the effect of, can we declare, a, put an end to this stupid, everybody standing there to catch somebody diving shit and leave it in this decade. And a year later, apparently, no, you can't. But so put Cornette, Ross, and CM Punk 
in that column, apparently, that doesn't like the stupid dive into the pool of people. And once again, Pat McAfee, the more I see him, the more I hear about things he's doing, like wearing the neck brace, a guy that would have fit into previous generations of professional wrestling. Yeah, because, well, it, what, what did we say earlier in the program? He didn't want to be a part of something to change it all around to fit him. He wanted to be a part of something and prove that he could be good at what it was. There's a difference. <laughs> Imagine if there was no standards for any other. Well, you can't paint. Okay, just fucking stick your finger in the fucking bucket and s swirl it around because we don't know what we're looking at anyway. Everything's acceptable or anything. Just get in this and just do it however you want to do it whether that's the way it's done or not. Then I guess everybody's talented, aren't they? Yeah, I guess if, so. If there's, no, if there's no way to measure uh, the, the success of what you're doing based on what it's supposed to be, well, fuck. Build me something, Brian. I don't care what it is. Just build me something. Well, it won't be a wrestling promotion. I can tell you that. Our next a question. A amen. <laughs> Our next question. Sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Ty in Alabama. I just read an old Bleacher Report article that listed Lex Luger as the most overrated wrestler of all time. Oops. The article claimed that Luger hardly cared about being a good worker and was more interested in partying. I was a bit surprised because I always enjoyed Luger's matches and storylines. Does Jim have any interesting Lex Luger stories for us? Well, first of all, that's the reason why that I don't know anything about Bleacher Report or whatever, but even, even some now like Sports Illustrated with this website business, it used to be you used to have to have a experience and a background in, in writing reporting whatever to write for sports illustrated as a magazine or time or newsweek or whatever but now everybody i guess can just get on the on the websites and just contribute articles whether they know anything about the topic or not we've discussed this the other day with the whatever that was on sports illustrated they tried to call an article about wrestling oh the bret hart thing yeah but you know but <laughs> Apparently, this guy just doesn't like Lex Luger. Either that or he talked to somebody who doesn't like Lex Luger. How did Lex Luger suddenly become the most overrated wrestler in history? Especially in a, a world, a universe that the Ultimate Warrior lived in. Again, I hate to go back to my favorite whipping boy, but, you know, when you excel at something and you attain a number one position and you've turned back all challengers, then you get mentioned a lot. And... As far as being overrated for anybody thinking he had any talent to do anything in the wrestling business, the Ultimate Warrior attains that number one position. Lex was very good at several points in his career, especially in 89, 90 as a heel, right? Um, Even as a babyface in 90, as, he was As a right. babyface, as a babyface, <clears throat> yes, when they, when they switched him after Sting. Uh, he had good matches. We've reviewed some of them on some of the big shows. He's far from, you could list 20 other guys that were pushed beyond their capability past Lex. Uh, another thing, the party go, go out and party guy for most of Lex's time that I worked with him in Crockett and then early in the Turner era of WCW and really until the mid nineties, when things started going South, Lex wasn't a going out and partying guy. He was married. He had a wife. He lived in Charlotte. Wasn't, you know, uh, a, a crazy person that would be making headlines, at, you know, at, at the fucking Bennigan's like the Horseman or fucking Wahoo or somebody like that. Uh, he did put work in to be better, both in the ring and in his promos. We've mentioned he had shortcomings as a baby face. He didn't connect with people. He was not a wrestling fan as a kid, so early on he struggled because he didn't understand how to relate and what was going on. He was a better heel because he was an aloof kind of guy. But uh, but no, to knock him like that uh, is ridiculous. Plus the whole concept of overrated. You know, it's one of those things every year in the Observer Year-End Awards I yeah. just wondered about. Like, you know, most overrated, you'd see Kevin Nash or this person. And I'm thinking, who's rating them? 
to say that they're overrated, who's rating them? When you say Brad Armstrong is the most underrated, well, no, the readers of this publication all rate him rather high. Yeah. He's not used correctly. It, 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 it over pushed or if what it what it should have been was over pushed or under pushed. Yeah. In the opinions of the people voting. Who's getting a push that doesn't deserve it and who's not getting a push that does deserve it? And sometimes they had quite a bit of a point, and other times maybe not. But I think Lex gets a bad rap, and I think some people have started to look at his career differently, but and see, I'll 80, say, yeah, 80 was really good, 80, 90 was excellent. 90 we, I mean, it wasn't just Flair, it was him and Stan Hansen. You think he enjoyed that? Yeah, not at all. But it was great. Uh, but here's the thing. We we were looking at Lex in those days with current eyes at that time. And it was like, okay, well, he's next to Flair and he's next to Arn and he's next to Tully and he's not whatever. But now that you go back and look at Lex Luger matches with today's eyes and the field of in-ring talent today, he, god damn, he looks so much better. AEW should sign him. Hey, well, I'm <laughs> I, I, no, Lex has had health issues. I'm not going to make any jokes, but I got to be honest with you. If 1990 Lex Luger was around right now, he would be one of the highest paid biggest stars in the business. He isn't in the WWE Hall of Fame. How big a grudge did Vince hold against him from walking out in 95 and being on that first Nitro? Pretty big. Pretty big. He is one of the, the people that is probably going to be inducted posthumously, if if that. I don't know that they, they've, they've not come to any agreement, nor has Vince seemed to be on his tail to do so, so far. So I guess that was just, that was the, the timing of that. That was a bit surprising. I remember being surprised at that when I was sitting there watching it in Knoxville. I was like, well, shit, I bet they don't know this is happening. <laughs> Because I'd just seen him at the previous TV taping, right? I guess this could get interesting. Jim, our next question, one that a few people sent in, but I'll read this one. Uh, it's more of a statement than a question, but I'm sure you'll get the gist of it. Sent to Corny Drive through at gmail.com from Steve Moore in Sherman, Texas. Hi, Jim. Just wanted to let you know that Steve Sasser, a.k.a. Steve Casey, Passed away in his sleep earlier today here in Texas. Oh, no. Huh. He was the kayfabe brother of Cowboy Scott Casey back in world class. He also wrestled in WCW as well as other territories. I'll mention here, Stephen Dane was a name that a lot of people may remember him by. Yes. He told me that he had an interaction with you once. It was something along the lines of you saying that the Midnight would beat his tag team partner since Steve had a name in the business. Anyhow, he was my friend. And I thought you and Brian would like to know. So any thoughts and memories about Steve Casey, a.k.a. Stephen Dane? Yeah. Um, well, actually, that was probably, as I'm thinking about now, that was probably been one of the TVs were in the old um, UWF territory. When Crockett had absorbed that, we started taping down there. Because Steve Casey, he was... At one time, Scott Casey's gimmick brother and and Stephen Dane, a, a lot of people may remember him. He had kind of white blonde hair and he's kind of a good physique and a mustache. He looked, he would put you in mind of Stan Lane That's if you right. looked at him right, right? Yeah. And, but anyway, it was probably one of the TVs that we were doing down there when, you know, th there was no more UWF territory and, and world-class Dallas was not doing too well. And so a lot of those guys had to get booked in the area that they were living in would do jobs on TV. If WWF or, you know, Crockett came in or whatever, and I'm sure it was there. And I, now that he has said that I can kind of remember working with him and a local guy. And I'm sure we said that because he had been working that territory uh, for a while at that point and people knew who he was. And, and, if it was being left up to just we're going over, why would you? Maybe somebody else would have wanted to beat the guy with the fucking name because he was the guy with the name. But it wasn't like we were had a choice of beating Hulk Hogan or not. We said, no, let the fucking kid take the fall, whatever. Anyway, he was in the NWA in 89, I remember. Yes. As a matter of fact, that's that was probably where most people would remember. And he was Stephen Dane there, was he not? No, I think he was still was Steve, he Steve Casey. Was he still Steve Casey? And by okay. the way. For a kayfabe brother, looked nothing like his kayfabe brother. No, absolutely nothing like Scott Casey. <laughs> but it was Texas, and they had done the thing. They both had mustaches at one point. 
but yes, I remember him that, that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, doing a lot of the TBS TVs and doing some of the house shows at that point. Yeah, he he was a good guy. And, and I, I would assume that the reason why he got out of the business was just because that was when a lot of guys got out of the business. Cause unless you got a job with one of two places, there was nothing else to do. Yeah. He was working a lot in the early nineties in Dallas, which was just a dying area. It was, well, it was a dead area. Um, yeah. Attempted to be revived over and over again by various people. And that was the last I remember seeing him for GWF. Yeah. And, and that makes sense. Cause he was, he was from that, that area. And I, I don't have any real good stories cause we never, you know, spent that much time around each other, but you know, yeah, just, we lost a lot of talent when the territories closed up that had another, would have had another five or 10 years on their careers just because there was <clears throat> it suddenly everything constricted and there was no place to go. Our next question, Jim sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Danny Byers in Covington, Kentucky. Oh, for heaven's sake. What did you just say? Danny Byers in Covington, Kentucky. Covington. Covington, Kentucky. Covington, Kentucky. Covington. Not Covington. Covington. As you right know. Up the, right up there across the river from Cincinnati. My Aunt Lola and Uncle Tommy lived in Covington on 13th Street for years and years and years. Did they know Danny Byers? I, no, they had. Well, they did know the Byers family. They always oh. told me stay away from the Byers family. Oh, wow. They were big troublemakers up there. Well, here's Danny's question. As Danny, you, I got your note. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. As you know, I am stoned as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should stay away from them. Jim. Yeah, apparently Aunt Lola was a proper judge of people. As you know, I am stoned as hell waiting out the COVID-19 in this bunker in northern Kentucky. <laughs> He's in a bunker. I've been listening every day and turning neighbors on to the YouTube broadcasts. Can you settle an argument about Terry Funk for us? I told the neighbor Funk was wrestling in a small Kentucky town near Bowling Green back in the 1980s and a little old 80-year-old grandma tried to kill him with a 38 pistol over Jerry the King Lawler. He's calling me a liar. We agreed to let you be the final word. I know what happened. There wasn't any footage, but the regional news covered it when it happened. Don't know the details, but didn't the Kentucky State Police have to remove the old woman? And that's the Well... <laughs> There is historical precedent for old ladies with handguns having to be removed from wrestling events in the state of Kentucky, but I have never heard of it happening during one of the Lawler and Funk matches. Now, now you would have been there for that more than likely. Well, here's the thing: phrase where how how did he phrase where it occurred again? Uh, let's see. In a small Kentucky town near Bowling Green back in the 1980s. Okay, there's the problem. Terry Funk never made any small Kentucky towns in Bowling Green, near Bowling Green in the 1980s because he was already too big of a star. And actually, Bowling Green is a small Kentucky town. Terry didn't even make the spot shows that small. Terry, during that run with Lawler, made Louisville, Evansville, Lexington, Nashville, and Memphis. And there may have and and a couple of Jackson, Tennessees. Uh, he was on no spot shows whatsoever. Um, I'm not denying. And also, the if if it was in Louisville, then the Kentucky State Police would have not been involved because they used the Louisville City Police as security. So I'm not saying that multiple incidents didn't happen. I'm sure in, in little towns near Bowling Green that many women were carted out with handguns. I'm sure that Lawler and Funk caused some problem in Louisville at some point in time because there were a number of security incidents during that time. I don't remember a, a old woman with a handgun on that specific run. Uh, I think he's conflating a bunch of things that have all happened down through history. How many times when you were either a photographer or playing the music into the boom box or, or into the microphone from the boom box. How many times do you remember seeing a gun pulled at a wrestling show? Um, well, thankfully I never actually was close enough to see the gun. 
there was um there was several stories that uh were related about the cops either grabbing somebody with a gun because see I was never on the heel aisle way going back after a match. I was always still up at the ring. There was a couple stories of people grabbing or the cops grabbing people with a gun on them. One guy had his hand in his pocket, as I recall. One was never pulled in the building, as best I can remember, in Louisville. But they, you know, as somebody just tweeted me and asked me about the uh, the time you remember, uh, a guy shot in Chicago at Bobby Heenan and Nick Bockwinkle when they were fucking Vern Gagne around and missed all of them and shot two or three people at ringside. Bobby told me about that himself. And you would always have guys coming in and telling, or cops coming in and telling stories about, yeah, I tackled this guy, and when we got him to the back, he had this knife about a foot long, or he had this gun on him, or he had whatever the fuck in his pocket. The, the cops used to love to come back and tell you that. When they had tackled somebody, they'd come back and tell you everything he was carrying that he could have used on you. And the one of the biggest ones in Louisville at the Gardens was, I think, in 76. Lawler was still a heel. He's fucking getting heat on the baby face. I've got a picture of the cops carrying this guy out, by the way. He's getting heat on the fucking baby face. And this guy hits the ring, but he, when Marks would hit the ring and try to attack the heels, what would save you a lot of times was the ropes would flummox them. Because, I mean, you've seen people trying to get in a ring at a wrestling show that don't normally get in a ring, civilians and fans and just playing around, and they get all fucked up when there's no pressure on them, right? So a lot of times these guys, they'll run and they try to dive underneath the bottom rope and slide in. That's where you got them. As soon as he slid in, he's starting to come up. He's on his hands and knees. Lawler football kicked this guy under the chin, and it looked like a cartoon the way his head snapped up on a fucking eight-foot neck and then back down. And he and the cops had him by the feet by that point, and they jerked him right out on his face, and they hauled him out. Come to find out, he just got out on parole from prison for murder. And the first thing he does is he's going to hit the ring and beat the shit out of Jerry Lawler. It didn't work out like he planned. So, you, you know, you never knew, but a lot of the, you just assume that's why if anybody, when you were going down the aisle way, had their either hand in either pocket, either kick them in the balls or just punch them and worry about it later. Cause their chances are, they're not reaching for their wallet. Didn't Johnny Valentine have a thing he would say, and I may be getting it slightly wrong where if you're walking back, and there's one guy who won't get out of the way. Everyone else is clearing out. And there's one guy facing you, and he won't get out of the way. Yeah. Walk around him. Yeah, he's the one. He's the Just one. Sad step. Because he's wanting you to do something. And uh, a lot of times, you know, it, it, well, like, it's not the big burly guy, although there was one time in Biloxi, Mississippi, fuck, this fucking big, he looked like Plowboy Frazier if Plowboy had an even larger head. Uh, just a big corn fed farm guy glommed onto Bobby and Bobby, all he could do was reach up and hook him in a front face lock. And the guy started standing up and Bobby's legs were fucking trailing around. This guy had to be 350, right? And his Bobby's legs are up in the air and the cops are trying to get, it's a whole skirmish. There's other fights going on. So every cop is not just going after this guy and this Bobby wouldn't let go of him. And the guy wouldn't put Bobby down, he wiped out like half a fucking ringside with Bobby until finally he got tired with <laughs> Bobby's 200 and something pounds on him and he fucking bent over and Bobby's feet got to the ground again. He was able to fucking get him down and and then the cops took over. Um, But it's not always the danger. It's, it's either an old man or sometimes even an old woman or somebody that you wouldn't look at. They're the ones that's going to slip in and either stick you or whatever and, and you're not even paying attention because you're looking at all the the visual threats. When was the first time you heard the story about the fan pulling the gun to protect the junkyard dog from Michael Hayes? The first night I was in the downtown municipal auditorium, <laughs> Christmas night, 1983, when they said, oh, so you got to watch these people. Because I had asked, actually, because I went out, and at that point in time, this was one of the, the first house show we had made in Mid-South Wrestling. But, um, you know, I'd seen some footage from other places, uh, the, the the arenas that they ran, and also I've come from Memphis, and a lot of the Memphis towns, you had like a rope around the ring with the the little metal stands, and it was the clothesline, don't come in this ringside area. 
But I looked out in New Orleans, they had the, you've seen them on Cops when they do the Mardi Gras episodes, the bicycle rack metal railings with NOPD or New Orleans police or whatever on them. They actually had those all the way to the ring in the, in the auditorium from the door you came out all the way down the aisle and all the way around the ring. And there was like 15 feet, easily 15 feet in between the ring and the, the railing. And that was unusual. Usually there in those days, six or eight feet because they had to get more ringside in. And that's when the boys started telling me, well, it didn't used to be that way. And they had to make it that way. but And then they started telling me all the stories about the New Orleans downtown auditorium. The room right next to the back door, we'd, we'd park in a, a parking lot out back and the cops would watch the area and you'd walk in that back door to the locker room. But there was a small room right next to the back door. When any of the fans jumped in the ring and tackled a fucking heel and the cops grabbed them and brought them back, they would hold them there. And when the heel came back from the ring, the cops would give the heel the option of going into that room with the fan and closing the door for two minutes so that they could discuss all the things they apparently still needed to discuss. And the cops would stay outside. And then after the two minutes, they'd go, you know, knock, knock, if it took that long. And the wrestler would leave, and then they'd go get what was left from the fan and throw him out in the parking lot. Tony Zane was one of the, uh, he was friends with Arn Anderson. They were both from um, a fucking goddamn now. I've lost uh, 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 Arn's hometown, Georgia. Got Rome, Rome, Georgia. Tony Zane was from Rome, Georgia. D Tony dated Dusty Rhodes' daughter for a little while. And as a job guy, that put tremendous pressure on him. But he was working Mid-South. He ran in to do a, a pull apart one time between JYD and I think DiBiase. And he got stabbed. The job guy got stabbed by a fan while doing a pull apart. And then they told me the story of the, the fucking dog and, and being blind in the corner. That was the building where the, the guy came over the rail with the gun and said that the free bird said, don't worry, dog, I got him. So all these stories, I'm like, fuck. So that's why, you know, <laughs> that's you why know, you wore a bulletproof vest. Well, yeah, that, that was one of the, you know, one of the reasons why in some of these situations, <laughs> Uh, but but really in New Orleans, by that point, it was better because that 15 feet around the ring, the the New Orleans police bicycle rack railings, they had they brought the cops on horseback to clear the parking lot out or the, the back entrance, um, you know, after the matches were over with to keep people from starting shit in the parking lot. So it was better by the time we got there. The the towns were, that were bad when we got there was the Tulsa's and the Homa, Louisiana's and the fucking Little Rock, Arkansas, which is where the cops actually gave me the bulletproof vest. When when they got new vests, the Little Rock Police Department, the, one of the main guys that worked the security at Barton Coliseum, brought it to me and gave it to me. And, and this was his quote, I think you need this more than I do. He said, here, he said, now remember, <laughs> it won't stop ice picks, but it's good for, for knives and then bullets if they hit the blah, blah, blah. But ice, I said, thank you for bringing up, I hadn't thought of ice picks yet. <laughs> Appreciate you bringing that up for me. But in, in New Orleans, it, it, the dog was so hot with that thing, but when DiBiase turned on him, that's when they had to take DiBiase out of the building in the trunk of Grizzly Smith's car, and he had to drive down the drive down the road before he could let Ted out because the people were waiting for DiBiase. But they knew Grizzly, and he was everybody's favorite, and he was, you know, a, a beloved wrestling legend around there to the fans, so they let him pass right by. They didn't know that DiBiase was closed up in the trunk of his car. They'd have killed him. They'd have burned the car with him in it. In your Midnight Express book, notoriously out of print, <laughs> You, no toyfully. You reprint some death threats that you received yeah. at various points. When was the first time, you know, I don't know if you were sitting in the locker room and someone came over and said, oh, you should know this came in. Like, when was the first time you were alerted to the idea there was a death threat against you? Well, see, here's the thing. A lot of those that were printed in the book, they didn't, they didn't send those to the goddamn newspaper. Hey, tell Cornette I'm going to kill him. They sent them to, they were addressed to me directly, care of TBS or care of Jim Crockett promotions or whatever in the mail. So I would open, I'd be the first one to see them. 
And about, look at this one. Every once in a while, I'd show the boys. This guy seems, you know, quite serious. Because, I mean, you know, you differentiated the ones from the 18 or 16 or 14 year old girls that were obviously written in colored pen and on colored stationery. And it, one of them, even literally a quote was when I turn 18, I'm going to find you and kill you for what you did to the rock and roll express. Okay. But then there's the other ones where it's just on a, a fucking card, like a postcard, or there's no name or just signed a fan. You make a great target under those lights. You'll never see where it comes from. Bye bye. That was one of, <laughs> written on a yellow scrap of paper folded over in the middle and then and with no signature or anything. Or the one that was quoting Bible verses after I set fire to Ronnie Garvin. The fact that I set fire to a man's face. Well, this Bible verse says, Yea, you will burn in eternity. You have it coming. You will be judged by blah, 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 and this whole religious. You know, you think, well. Hopefully I won't run into those people, but, uh, you know, but they didn't actually just come in and say, Hey, now, th the one time they did for DiBiase and in, in little rock, I've told this story, but they actually phoned that into the building. Um, DiBiase was in a main event, I think against Duggan for the North American title. And it was us in a rock and roll with me in the cage over the ring for the mid South tag title. And the cops come in the locker room and, and told DiBiase, called him over in the corner. Somebody had called the, the box office and said, I want a front row ticket. And they said, well, those are sold out. And they said, well, how close can I get? And they said, sixth row or whatever. I want as close as I can get because I'm going to shoot Ted DiBiase and hung up. So they took that, the building said, you know, because they didn't normally have people calling up saying, yeah, when the Stones play, I'm going to shoot Keith. Right? So they told... Uh, I get Jack Curtis was probably the the uh, guy that was the agent at that point, and he, you know, had extra cops come in, and they accompanied DiBiase out, extra police in the building watching the fans while they had their match, and then Teddy comes back, and he's fine and didn't get shot, and then I'm fucking pissed, right? Because now we got to go out. There may be a guy, a frustrated assassin out there with a fucking gun, and I'm going to be in the straight jacket hung over the ring so he can get a clear shot at me without having to worry about risking the life of any of the innocent fans. So I was in the cage. That's where I just sat down in the bottom of the cage, kind of leaned over and made myself small for the, uh, uh, for the duration of the match. But I mean, you know, it, it, it depends on the threats. If it really, I mean, they were all bogus obviously because nothing ever happened, but if you're really going, if, 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 like a grandstand, I'm going to shoot the guy. That was more to ruin everybody's day, right? Or the bomb threat at the Channel 5 studio that time, just so they'd have to clear everything out. I always kind of took the ones in the mail, like, you know, you see this in true crime. He's he's sending the letters, and then finally he gets the equipment and goes out to find this guy. So, But we didn't worry that much then, because you, it wasn't like today. You couldn't find where people lived so easily. And and just, you know, track down everything about them. And also, fuck, I wasn't going to dwell on the negative. You know, I had too many people to piss <laughs> off. Well, Jim, a few more questions before we wrap things up here today. This next one was sent to Corny Drive through at gmail.com from Travis. I'm a longtime fan and an avid listener of your assorted podcasts. I was originally introduced to professional wrestling through Continental Championship Wrestling in the panhandle of Florida, in the early 1980s. I recently looked up a list of former NWA heavyweight champions and was surprised to discover that Dusty Rhodes never had a lengthy heavyweight title run. Despite being one of the biggest stars of the late 70s and 80s, his longest run was 88 days. Why did the NWA never give Dusty Rhodes a lengthy heavyweight title run? Oh, good lord. Um... Uh... Let me enumerate the, it's hard to explain, I guess, <clears throat> now to people who are used to more modern wrestling because, you know, just everybody gets the belt and it doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. Dusty didn't need the belt. Dusty was, was Dusty did not fit the profile of what the NWA champion was supposed to be at that point in time. 
Dusty was an attraction all his own without the belt. Uh, with the NWA champion, for those days, you wanted a guy who was, and this was the transition period, went from a, you know, just a pure technical worker like a Jack Briscoe and a Dory Funk Jr. to a guy who's a great technical worker but flashy like Flair. But you wanted a guy who not only could work every style, not only could do an hour with with guys and work their match, travel uh, to the different territories and make the local star look better than he ever has. That was what you wanted with Dusty. Not only was that not his, necessarily his bailiwick, but it's not what he should have done. People wanted to see Dusty Rhodes, the American dream, because he was a star. They didn't want to see Dusty come in and make their local guy look better than he ever had. They wanted to, they wanted to see Dusty. And, and, and Dusty needed to have the, the shorter matches with more action and the gaga and the excitement to be Dusty, to be the American dream and more juice and more stipulations. It, he it, Dusty's forte was not working a world title style match. The reason why he got the belt on a, a couple of occasions, not just because he was Booker at the time, because he got the belt first time way before he was the Booker. He got the belt because he was one of the biggest stars in the business, one of the biggest box office attractions, and it would start detracting from people's faith in Dusty if he never won the big one. That was the the deal back then is when you got a, a baby face that was so hot in different places and so popular, and he would come up short and come up short. It's why Lawler, uh, the Memphis had to switch affiliations from NWA to AWA to finally get him a run because for their business, Lawler had come up short so many times he couldn't fail again or else was it was really going to hurt things. Dusty was given the belt a few times there early on because he was so big for to him never to get it would have hurt the Golden Goose. But for him to keep it for a long period of time, again, in a completely different way, same thing as The Undertaker was never a champion in the WWF long term, fit and spurred here and there. Um, he didn't need it. And it wasn't his forte. Um Plus, while Dusty could work heel, it would have been a bad idea for Dusty Rhodes at that point in time to work heel. Oh, God, yeah. And you and, needed and, someone who could work either babyface or heel everywhere they went. And plus, besides that, if you booked at that time Dusty Rhodes into a territory against your top babyface, who they saw all the time, they'd cheer Dusty over the top babyface because he was new and he was, you know, oh, we're seeing Dusty Rhodes. So it, it just... Nothing to do with even his style or athletic ability or talent or whatever. It, he was not the type of person to have the NWA belt and didn't need it. Didn't need it, but do you think he wanted it? Well, obviously, you always want to be the world champion, even if sometimes you, you don't ne might not necessarily recognize that you shouldn't be the world champion. Uh, he wanted, but also he was smart enough to know that if if he never got it at all, it would hurt his credibility. So he got it enough to say that he'd had it and then found good reasons or not good reasons, but ways to lose it where there was a reason otherwise than him just getting beat. What did Flair think when they did the title switch in 1986? Um, what do you mean? What did Flair think? Was he happy about dropping the belt of dusty? Well, I don't, he didn't come to the, everybody in the locker room and go, well, fuck this fucking shit. Um, I don't know that he was necessarily happy about it. But at the same time, at that at that point, I can see where, you know, that was a big fucking program, and Dusty had to win at some point. Maybe, you know, was that the proper time? Maybe, maybe not, but he had to do it at some point just to keep things going. Well, you know, Jim, a lot of fans think that Dusty Rhodes should have looked into some legal action against Terry Funk for breaking his arm. A lot of folks think that Brian Lash should have done more work on his segues this week, but folks, I'll <laughs> tell you this right now. He broke his arm. That's why he lost the title back in 79. If, if a wrestler or a group of wrestlers attacks you backstage, and Lord knows that happens at least two dozen times a week in modern wrestling, you need a good personal injury attorney. If you have been injured or damaged in some form you need a good attorney and we know exactly who you can call call steven p Oh, 
good show or two. Still to the rest. Yes, folks, I'll guarantee you one thing. Brian Last may be the king of bad segues, but without doubt, Stephen P. New of NewLawOffice.com, 888-692-8084, is the king of torts. He's been writing writs all morning. If you've read the writs he's written, you'll know they're really well-written writs, and he can write a writ for you. No matter what the problem, we've talked about the opioid addiction issues that he has taken up the cases for. We've talked about the defective earplugs. We've talked about the Zantac and the Roundup causing cancer. Stephen has been involved in helping people get compensation for all those things. And now, as of the date of this airing, Stephen P. New and New Law Office, they have jumped into filing lawsuits on behalf of, get this now, 47 different veterans, Brian, who were assaulted by one of the physicians at the Beckley, West Virginia VA hospital. Apparently, over a period of like 18 months, this creepy doctor assaulted, and you know what we're talking about, 47 American service veterans. And this is not one of those, well, did he do it or didn't he do it? He's already pled guilty to the criminal charges. He said, yes, I did it. And these are the civil lawsuits that Stephen and his firm are going to be filing on behalf of these these veterans that have been at a VA hospital. So shit like this goes on, folks. And if you've had shit like this go on in your family or with your friends, you need somebody that'll tell you straight on what's going on. Stephen P. New. NewLawOffice.com, 888-692-8084. And I guess now be careful when you go to the doctor. You know, I had a situation last time I went to have a physical. I didn't think it was that bad when the doctor stuck his finger up my ass, but the problem was he had both his hands on my shoulders at the same time. I don't know if we should be making light of I I don't know how he did it, but anyway. All right. Do we have time for music on the program today? On that note, the drive through has closed. 99 Six Duffalo. All right. Nah. I think you need to have your left balloon checked. Maybe the right one, too. <laughs> You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Coronet. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcast. I don't know why you just cracked me up so much with that. I just, oh shit, I blew Sprite up in my nose. That burns. <laughs> you can hear classic episodes of the drive through Eddie Experience by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash cornet. For those of you who have been waiting for the Alice era to end, <laughs> the Alice era has ended, so the episodes now being uploaded each and every Sunday evening are Alice free, but go through all the, the archive episodes. The enema has been expulsed. <laughs> patreon.com slash cornet of course the official jim cornet youtube channel tinyurl.com slash official corny youtube or just go to youtube and search for jim cornet full episodes clips of episodes omnibus collections if there's something you hear on these shows and you love it and you want to share it go there and find the clip and share it the official jim cornet youtube channel cornet's collectibles at jimcornet.com Go there and check out what is still for sale and what is just, out of just, stock. Just fuck it. Just wait till after Christmas. Just wait. You're going to need to get something new in January. Well, you ain't going to get it in January. At jimcornet.com. Maybe February. The drive through is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New. 888-692-8084. He's now taking left balloon cases. You've had a problem with the lack of inflation of your left balloon. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until Friday on The Experience, and next week right back here on the wonderful drive through for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! Last thing you want is all the air let out of your left balloon. <laughs>